Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the second School of Destiny on the topic Smart Data Processing and, and Systems of the Deep Insight. Our first presenter for today are Professor Lauren Ferro and Dr. Francesco Sabio from Sabienza University of Rome. Please, whenever you are ready, you can start with your presentation. Hello, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Just make sure everything's working. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me just share my screen a moment. <clears throat> I apologize for the, the appearance, but I'm currently in a place where someone has COVID. So unfortunately, this is... Okay, take care. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, can you see my, my screen with the, the presentation? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. As um, as you mentioned, we also have there's two parts to this presentation. Um, uh, my colleague Francesco Sapio is going to do the the other part of this presentation, which is a little bit more technical. Um, and I will going to I will, my part will talk more about let's say the theory and the practice behind what is gamification. Okay. Um, and of course, if you guys have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the chat um, or ask them. The way that I've organized this presentation or the way that we have organized this presentation is, is like so. So I'm going to talk a little bit about game history and gamification. And then Francesco will continue to talk about contemporary technologies, the role of AI in games. And we'll look at some real world examples of things like virtual reality and augmented reality experiences. Um, just a very quick introduction about me. I am a game designer, researcher, consultant in the world of game design and interaction. And I also teach game design here at Sapienza in, in Rome. Um, I previously have a PhD in player profiling and modeling, so I'm very interested in, in human behavior. And along with Francesco Sapio, we also co-lead the official Unreal Engine meetup here in Rome. So we're really trying to progress, you know, the game culture here in Italy, and we're trying to also open open the world, open the eyes of the world, at least here in Italy, in terms of the technologies that are available and the technologies that will soon be available and how we can use and implement them into um, different scenarios. Um, Francesco, if you're a quick introduction. Hi, can you? you hear me? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> hi, everyone. My name is uh, Francesco Sabio and I'm a researcher at Sapienza have a strong background in artificial intelligence. I'm a professor of game design and development, and I worked as a contractor for many private companies, uh, ranging from uh, um, consultation for uh, commercial games uh, through developing educational games uh, and work on many other projects. And along with um, Professor Ferro, I'm also the co-leader of Unreal Engine uh, Meetup uh, here in Rome and uh, more about Unreal uh, in the second part of the presentation. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco. To, to really understand what gamification is and to really understand game design and how it works, I wanna go back a little bit in history, you know, a little bit, let's say, you know, the last few thousand years. And why I'm doing this is because I wanna show that the idea of game design, what is game design, the components of game design, the game elements and mechanics that we do use in, in gamified experiences, do actually have their origins back here as well. When you look at games like Senate with the ancient Egyptians, the royal game of Ur, um, backgammon, modern day chess, you know, a lot of these games, even though they were conceived and developed thousands of years ago, still possess very similar mechanics, if not the same, to what we use today. Right. If you take the, the game of Senate here, it still has very, you know, you have a game board, you have pieces, they move, they interact in very much the same way. The only difference here with Senate was that back then they didn't have things like dice, right? They had sticks, sticks that had particular colors on them that as you threw them, they would then give you a value that would allow you to progress throughout the board. Um, and we saw similar things, you know, games like this were also very much part of their culture. Right here, we have Queen Nefertari, who was playing Senate to try and seek guidance about the afterlife. What would be the outcome? How would she sort of go after she she crossed over to the other other world, so to speak? 
you know, Senna was also part of comical representations. There's actually a story behind this image where you have the lion and the gazelle, you know, and they're, they're playing Senate and whoever wins got the opportunity to then, you know, go to bed with the other, the other animal. And it's the important thing here that I want to represent is that games, even back thousands of years ago, were very much still part of social culture, were part of, you know, people having fun, engaging with things, whether it was to tell a story or to seek guidance or to express themselves. You know, some, you know, years later, you have the royal game of Ur, and you can see here too that there is the evolution of the board. We start having a lot more details. We also start to have here different types of chips. So here you got, we have this um, pyramid style dice, and then we have these, these markers that the player uses. This is a two player game that allows them to move around the board, All right? Um, as we sort of moved on in time, we also started to have different um, ways of, of finding information, different ways of calculating you know, moves or interactions. In fact, some of the earliest known dice originated in, um, you know, animal parts in, in bones of, of goats and, and sheep. And you can see here, there's some, some incisions made that represent numerical values, just like we see in modern day dice. And then over time, during the Roman Empire, they also adopted this, this idea, and it transformed. And then eventually with dice, we also began to have different game pieces. And what's really interesting is that the, the concept of the dice, of having some sort of quantifiable um, value that would allow us to move in, in a game space, existed right across the world, even before we really had the ability to travel large distances. Regions throughout the entire world were developing their own version of a dice. Um, you know, you even have more older games like Six Man's Mars, Nine Man's Mars, which have also stood the test of time and have also evolved into what we know as tic-tac-toe or noughts and crosses. Chess, the same thing. But what's really important here is that even though these games have undergone evolutions, they've developed, they've changed, we've had pieces removed, pieces added, players removed, players added. The, the components are still the same. It's just different combinations of these, these components. If you look here in the bottom left-hand corner, we have the game Chadaranga, which is four-player chess, basically. You have Chinese variant, we have Persian variants, Japanese variants. In fact, the Japanese variant, Shoji, or ultimate Shoji, has thousands of pieces, potentially thousands and thousands of moves. Right? If you look up here, each piece is individual. But the functionality is still the same. It's it doesn't really work that much different than the chess that we know and love and play today. Um, you know, we've seen it also transcend dimension quite literally and popularized through uh, culture. Um, you can see here in, in in Star Trek, we've also had variations. Vikings end up developing their own version of chess. We have you know other similar strategies like in Go, where the idea is still to capture the player's pieces. Um, and then so on. And then, you know, we have this game called Mankala, which is very popular, especially in African culture. But it also has a lot of, in, it's had a lot of influence on modern day game design. In fact, Mankala, the, the concept that the game revolves around where you have to reposition these, these balls or these, these pieces of stone, you have to reposition them around the map. has also influenced a lot of modern day gaming or particularly board game um, interactions. And then as obviously we, we sort of developed as a species, our technology developed, our, our understanding of the world developed, we started having different technologies. And because humans are humans and we're curious and we like to play around with different things and we like to really push the limits of how technology can work, um, many, many scientists, many researchers looked at different ways that they could use the screens or the way that they could use existing functionality and things that, you know, were typically supposed to just measure frequency or electricity. And they made games out of these things. They repurposed them. And then eventually that, that idea of electronic games started to catch on and people started to develop, again, still having the same similar concepts that existed thousands of years ago. And then, you know, with this idea of electronic games came the arcade era, era where people started to create all these different ideas of capturing, you know, opponents, collecting different items and so on. In fact, it gave birth to the, the arcade era, which 
also created another culture, created competition, it created a more of a, a social status amongst players, right? Everyone wanted to have those, those three letters at the top of the leaderboard. But the problem with this is that, you know, it costs money to play arcade. So a lot of companies saw the opportunity to try and bring that arcade experience back home. So we saw the rise of consoles and then began the console war, which, you know, unfortunately, you know, you had lots of different companies with different technologies. Technologies was getting more advanced. Chipsets were getting much more advanced. Graphic settings were getting much more advanced. You had a lot of different consoles, you know, sort of pushing to have their, their you know, space, in the, their place in, in this world of gaming. And then eventually came the, the personal computer. So with the Apple, with the, the Commodore 64 and PCs or computers start to really pose a threat because not only could they allow people to play games, but they could also do other things, right? You could do your taxes on your computer. You could do, you know, Word documents, send emails. So this started to also become a threat to the, the evolution of gaming, at least from a console perspective. And the problem was, is that at a certain point, you had an oversaturation of consoles. Everyone was trying to make games. Everyone was pushing the games out. Technology was developing. Consoles were getting redeveloped. And every couple of years, you'd have a new console. Problem with this is that they weren't backward compatible. So you, everyone would be buying and updating consoles to play the latest games. But then that was expensive. So people stopped doing it. Games were being pushed out too fast. They were buggy. They didn't work. And it's not like now where if you publish a game, you can just upload a patch or, you know, fix things later on. That game had to be perfect from the launch because they were on physical cartridges or CDs. However, due to this oversaturation, we had the video game crash of 1983, which saw basically all or most of these companies fall into bankruptcy. Um, and basically, they just stopped to exist. And then you had the rise from the ashes, the, the, the famous Nintendo versus Sega saga. And this is basically how the Nintendo original Nintendo seal of quality originated because they didn't want to repeat of what had happened with the oversaturation, right? They wanted to produce games that were finished, that worked, that functioned. Um, so that you, for a while, for, for some years, you had this, this race between Nintendo, uh, between Nintendo and Sega. Ultimately, Sega lost um, and sort of became a little bit of a part of Nintendo. But then we also saw the rise of Sony PlayStation and Xbox, um, which were later developed by Sony Entertainment and Microsoft. And in fact, these are the main consoles that still exist in, in contemporary time. And the point is, is that even given this evolution, we have all this access to fantastic technologies, right? The games are still the same. The components are still the same, and it doesn't matter if you're designing for an Xbox or PlayStation or mobile device. They still use the same functionality, the mechanics that existed in ancient Egypt, that existed during the arcade era, that exists now when we have beautiful games like Assassin's Creed or, or God of War that's pictured here. What's more important is that the games are more accessible. Right? We are able now that, to have games that are available to everybody and anybody. Okay, we have the idea of the possibility to customize the experience, to personalize it for the user. And vice versa, anybody and anyone can, can basically develop a game now, which is fantastic. We have technologies like Unreal Engine that have not only just the, the, the software, the engine to develop these experiences for, but also the resources, the models, the graphics, the user interfaces, which is really allowing people to expand and to develop this medium even further. So what is game design um, and what does it mean to be a game designer? And it's important to understand this. And I wanted to cover this because when you talk about gamification, you really need to understand game design. OK, and I've seen this also in my, my own experience. When people are new to game design and they want to develop a game, they're, they sort of feel overwhelmed. They don't know where to start. They know of things like points and badges and leaderboards, but they don't really understand how those things really work together or how they should be placed together. So this is why I wanted to very briefly um, cover this concept. So if we talk about what is a game, we talk about, you know, it's an activity that engages us for amusement or fun. OK, and I'll talk more about the, the, the fun word later on. but. It's, it's something that we, we engage with because we want to feel a sense of pleasure, a sense of enjoyment, right? It's not something, we don't choose to game to, to be punished, okay? 
Um, and, you know, we can talk about gaming as an adjective. We all say, you know, are you game? Are you, you know, are you ready? Let's, let's battle, right? And we can use it as a verb. So we're playing video games. What's more important, and, and it's a very popular topic in liter literature discourse, is that games are the embodiment of many things that we're already familiar with. They are the embodiment of art. They contain movies and books. Right, we see adaptions from film. We also see the, the development of interactive stories. Okay, where you choose your own adventure. Um, more of also these have become sort of gamified experiences where you know you have to buy virtual currency to unlock certain options, or you have to, you know, um, perform certain actions to be able to unlock certain parts of the story or different options to progress the story. Games also can exist um, in the sense where they don't have really a goal or a very explicit goal where you can just sort of play around. Sandbox environments, for example, really afford this kind of opportunity. Um, puzzles, I mean, games inherently are puzzles. They, they have problems that need to be solved, okay? whether they're complex problems or whether they are very simple problems, again, depending on what you're trying to achieve. And they facilitate competition. You know, we have the, the whole world now of esports where players actively and for money will compete against other players, games like Fortnite, League of Legends, Warcraft. Okay, and they really allow these opportunities to become not just a culture, but also an entire domain of, of work. And Game design is made up of many different aspects. It's made up of players, it's made up of objectives. And depending on whether you really want it as a narrative driven experience or whether you want something that's very based on providing feedback, such as an educational or, you know, um, like a serious game or game based learning experience, you might have a lot of these things or very few of these things, or you might have all of them, but they have a different level of emphasis. Okay. So, you know, you might be very orientated towards players because you've developed a gamified self-help application to manage weight loss or to manage, you know, manage a bad habit that they're trying to stop, such as smoking, for example. Um, and it's up to you as a game designer to think about which or what of these things are more important than the other. Which of these things should you be placing an emphasis on? And it is very tempting in the beginning to want to add all these things, to add all the points and the badges and the leaderboards and the quest systems. But sometimes it's actually not necessary. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I'm interested in game design, but I've never studied game design. You know, can I do it? Absolutely. All right. Game design is, is, is a very enigmatic creature in the sense that you can use all your own experiences from different disciplines and, and use them to inform game design experiences. Right. You know, if you have a background in economics, you, you could be really good at developing, you know, virtual currency or, or economic systems in games. You use that knowledge to influence those things. If you have a background in music, you have a better understanding about, you know, implementing sounds and sound effects into the experience. Same with mathematics. You can apply that knowledge when, you know, to programming aspects. Um, you know, and all of these things are required also to develop a game. Even if you're a one man team or if you work in a small studio, you need to at some point touch on these different elements because whether you're developing cinematics in your game, you will need to at least sort of study a little bit of cin cin cinematography to understand how the camera should move in the environment. Um, and you know psychology as well, if, especially if you're developing things for education or to motivate people, you need to understand how those things work. So what makes a game fun? Um, before I, I, I continue in this section, I hate this word, right? And I hate it because not because I don't like, like everyone likes fun, right? I hate it because it's a very, it's a very relative thing. And I have seen so many people that want to design a fun experience, but fun is sub subjective, right? Now, the reason this is a very tricky thing to, to develop is because you know, games are entered willfully, right? Games are voluntary experiences. We all play because we want to. Now, why I don't like the idea of coming into a design to, de to develop a fun game is because what I find fun and what you guys find fun are very different things. Now, I might find fun having goals, having lots of goals, having very explicit goals, where someone else might not. They might appreciate having a more 
or a less restrictive approach. They want a more open world environment. That for them, it's fun. Okay. Um, the same thing with challenges. Some people love challenges. They like that that sense of you know accomplishing something. Other people, not so much. Sure, challenges add a little bit more to their experience, but it's not the reason that they're engaging with it. Um, and the same with the different types of systems. You might have a very closed system where the players are, what they can and cannot do is very restricted. It's very limited. Okay, or you might have a very open thing where players have the option to choose or whether or whether or not they want to engage with certain challenges or certain goals. Okay, a lot of open world or online RPGs facilitate this kind of experience where you can choose to follow the main storyline or you can choose just to discard it and, and just do whatever you want, whenever you want, go mining for different objects, go connecting with different guilds and different players and do quests in random, you know, in a random way. Now, this is where we arrive to games that teach or have a purpose. Now, when we have to think about creating engaging or fun experiences, we need to think about what is the purpose that we're trying to, to address? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, and, you know, there may be very simple issues or very complex issues or very delicate issues. If you go to, I think it's Game for Change, gamesforchange.org, there are a lot of games there that are gamified approaches, serious games, educational games that touch on these things. They'll touch on political issues. They'll discuss health issues, societal issues, educational issues. Now, a lot of people, and there's still a very strong stigma around the use of educational games because people are afraid, especially educators are afraid, that they are intended to replace them. And this is actually not true. The point of an educational game is to complement the instructors or the, the, the teacher's work plan. It's there to support the lessons that they are producing. And that's why it's really important when we're designing educational games, gamified experiences, that we take these things in, into consideration. Right? When I talked about the goals, when we talk about the, the puzzles and the challenges that they try to align to these, these things that you know, educators are delivering during their lesson. And this is where we came to gamification and gamified experiences. So we've, I know it's been very brief, but the idea here is that you wanna try and understand, first of all, what it is that you want to achieve. What is the problem you're trying to solve? And I'll look at some examples so you can understand this in a little bit more detail as well. But Gamification is the use of game elements and mechanics to create experiences that are intended to motivate, primarily motivate users with world, real world problems, right? It leverages our love for competition and reward. So gamification works really well because either we're competitive with ourselves, we want to do better, where we want to improve ourselves, or it puts us in the competition with other people. We want to be better than the next person, right? Which we're human, it's, it's innate within us to always sort of be better, you know, for the most part. The beautiful thing also about gamified experiences and, and, and video games in general, but in particular for these types of experiences is that you have the option for instant real-time feedback. And this is why when people are developing games for education, this is a very good attribute to have. If you remember, or even now we still do testing and maybe a, a day later or a week later, we find out the results. Right, which is a little bit late once you get the result of how well you passed an exam or how badly you passed an exam. But if you're doing an engaging stuff, engaging with concepts in real time, you have that instant feedback, right? So you can self, you can auto correct yourself. You can look at that feedback and improve upon it and then move on. And the way that games and gamified experiences are designed is that usually you can't move forward until you've mastered the previous concepts, which goes a lot more further in consolidating a user's knowledge or understanding of certain things and we can also offer in 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 real time assistance and help right and give you know potentially endless possibilities you know we can give them lots and lots of different questions and if it's for example a mathematics experience right instead of the the problems that are just written within a book right book has limitations you can only fit so many equations or so many problems on one page in a game you could have thousands right um, 
and gamification or gamified experiences can exist in many ways. They can be on mobile, they can be on a computer, they could be in both. You can have a mix. You can have a mobile experience that connects to a, a smart whiteboard that then connects to a game, right? It doesn't have to be one experience that's on one platform. Of course, to achieve something like that, it's a little bit more technical, but it is possible. Um, and a lot of gamified experiences utilize what's called performance charts and dashboards. And think of these as like a statistic screen that gives you, as a, as a, as a user of these applications, a kind of overview of your, of your interaction, whether it is, you know, your progress, your improvement, the amount of mistakes that you made, where you're making these mistakes, so that you can then reflect upon these and then go back and then improve upon them. Right. You might find, for example, one particular area of mathematics is particularly troubling. It's very difficult. You're, you're not doing so well. So if you look in your dashboard, you have this information at hand. So you know which areas, especially if you're studying for an exam, you need to spend time on improving. And this is why I say to you, avoid using the F word, right? Fun. Not everyone experiences it the same way. Okay. And it's extremely important that as, as game designers, that you consider this when you are going into developer and experience. And I'll give a, a real world example. Several years ago, I was working um, on developing a training, a gamified training software to be used with um, police enforcement. And the, the, lead, the lead of the project had the idea of let's make something fun. And I'm like, wait, 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 you know, we, let, let's find out what these people do. Do they actually even play games? What, what you know, what what do they enjoy? And it's like, no, 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 we've got we to make it fun. We have to, you know, put in badges and points and things like that. And again, as, and I'm sure if you guys are consultants or have ever engaged in being a project lead, you can find, you, you know, that it's very difficult, right? Especially when you're working with other people to try and, and, and push and, and try to explain things in a particular way. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to explain to this person because they didn't, they were a statistician. They didn't have a lot of experience with game design. In fact, that's the reason I was hired. I was trying to explain to them that to have fun, you really, you need to understand your players. The idea is that the, the, the user is going to be spending a lot of time with this app, this training tool, right? Hours maybe. So you need to find things that uh, also for the long term, things that are going to sustain their interaction. If you just add points and badges, that's a very temporary thing. It's not a very long term um, approach to try and stimulate and keep them interested. Um, so you have to be very careful about these things because we did that in the end. We added the points and, and badges against my my own <laughs> suggestions, and they didn't they didn't appreciate it because they didn't want to have those things associated with the actions that they were doing. They're like, I know how to do this. I just want to get better at it, right? I want to get more efficient at it. So we had to sort of go back to the drawing board and try and find things that sort of gave them a little bit more of a push to keep keep going and to keep engaging with this software. And the reason why it's really important to understand how these things also connect is because of this concept, the magic circle. Now, traditionally, games have this sort of dichotomized you know, separation between what is the game and what is reality. And we have this thing called the permeable membrane or the the, the boundary that sort of divides reality and the game world. Um, and this is how games traditionally have thought of, right? Once you go into a game, you're playing by their rules, you're playing by their logic, okay? And then that's it. Um, and then once you finish playing the game, you come back into reality and you know the difference between what happens in that game, the conventions of that game and the, you know, the rules and the laws of reality. You know that if you play Grand Theft Auto, you can steal a car and that's totally fine, right? But you know that in reality, that's not so much okay. Gamification blurs this membrane, this boundary, right? It, it merges both reality and game. And this is why it's particularly important to really understand the player because what they do in that game or that gamified experience or that educational experience is intended to transcend into reality, right? If I'm learning, a, for example, I'm playing Duolingo to learn a language, the things that I am doing in that game are preparing me for interactions that will be in reality, right? The words that I'm learning, they're, they're adding to my, my, my vocabulary so that if I go traveling or if I meet someone that, that speaks that language, I have that ability. 
And then once I'm in reality, I'm practicing those words, okay? And then I start getting more familiar with these concepts and then I can go back into the game with that knowledge and then apply that to perhaps more complex or more complicated things, right? Such as declining verbs or adding, you know, masculine or feminine and uh, suffixes to words. Um, and the primary, one of the really primary or important things when you talk about gamification, because you do have this connection between the game and reality, is understanding player motivation. So like I said before, understanding fun, understanding what gets your player motivated or the, let's say, the average user of your, of your experience. Because, of course, you cannot design something that's going to be perfect for everybody, right? You have to really accept that and sort of, and sort of move on. But you have to try and work towards the, the majority of users. Now, we're humans. We love gratification, right? We all like, we all like to feel good. We feel like we, we like to feel that we're achieving something in life. We like to feel progress, okay? We are driven by pleasure, okay? If I give you an option, one that's very attractive, one that's very nice, something that you enjoy, whether it's food, whether it's an experience, and I give you something that's completely contrast to that, I would say 99.9% .9 of people are going to go for the pleasurable one, okay? Um, and this is why when you're talking about game, um, gamified or gamification, you need to understand what players find pleasurable, okay? Do they find competition pleasurable or does it give them anxiety, right? Um, for example, in Duolingo, you have that competitive element where you can verse other people in a leaderboard, which is fantastic if you're into that. OK, it allows you to progress through the different leagues. You can move from bronze to silver, silver to gold, gold, I think, to, to platinum or diamond or something like that, and so on and so forth. But for other people, that's anxiety. That, that, that's, that's, I don't want to be compared to other people. And if most of your players are like that, then it would be a mistake to add in some sort of competitive element. If, however, your players are driven through self-satisfaction, they are driven through intrinsic you know, motivation, which I'll talk about in a minute, adding things like progress bars, adding things like um, badges and achievements can give them a better self, a sense of satisfaction, right? It doesn't give them anxiety. They don't have to display publicly to the world that they're better than the next person. But they can feel as though they are progressing, they are developing their skills or they are learning. Um, and by using gamification designers, you want to lure players into that exciting and interesting world, right? You want to try and influence and enhance a user's natural desire for competition, for achievement, recognition, self-expression, right? You don't want to start out with this. I want all the stars and badges. You don't want players doing that in the beginning because you have to keep feeding that. And the problem with doing that is that it has to be more and more impacting later on. You give them five stars, right? That's great. But the next time they want more, you give them 10 stars. And then you have this, 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 this cycle where it just keeps increasing, increasing. But then they start to have perhaps to lose meaning. And that's very problematic. And you run into this problem, which is called over justification. Now, if someone is already intrinsically driven to do something, right? I'm intrinsically driven to learn a new language. I don't need to be constantly reinforced. Right? I'm there because I want to. I want to learn a new language. I find it interesting. Right? But if you every single time that I, I learn a new set of words, you give me badges and points and there's all this celebration each time that I do something, you, you can actually damage the player's motivation to do it. Right? And they did a study with children who were actually intrinsically motivated to draw and they kept rewarding each picture that they did with, with, the, with the reward. And eventually the kids stopped drawing because it had ruined their internal motivation to do something. So this is also another really delicate balance, which is why it's very important that you understand the people that you're designing for, that you understand what it is that gets them excited, that gets them motivated, right? And it's in particular these types of elements and mechanics that you need to pay attention to, okay? Like I said, if someone's already engaging with your app because they want to be there, because they're interested in that experience, then how you implement points and badges and leaderboards, if you implement them, will, will be different. Right? Maybe you don't put points for every action that the player engages with. Maybe badges are only given to players after so many you know, interactions or after so many tests have been completed. 
All right, maybe you add in story and quests because you want players to really be immersed in the environment, right? And then you implement questions or you implement testing procedures into those stories. Um, for example, I recently just ran a, a user test where I developed a training tool for cybersecurity and I implemented the questionnaire that I wanted to ask the player into the actual game narrative. So the game starts to so being the player is actually being interviewed for a position in this in this company. And all the all the pre-test questionnaire was implemented into this interview. Now, of course, we still had the like it scale, so it wasn't completely removed in terms of you know having the analytical feel, but it sort of helped to maintain that immersion. Um, and you know, it, it's it's much better than giving a player, you know, a big long questionnaire and then getting them to play the game and then giving them another long questionnaire later on to, to, to finish about their experience. We did the same for the post game questionnaire as well. It was part of the, you know, when the player was finishing the, the, the training session, the CEO of the company that was in the game was asking them about their experiences. And, and, and you know, again, even on a Likert scale, but it was still part of that whole narrative. So that entire experience was enclosed in on itself, but it was was still, you know, it still had that gamified approach because those skills that the player learned in that training game could be applied outside of that game, which is very important um, when you're developing these things. Same with objectives and goals. You need to have very explicit objectives or very explicit goals. This is particularly important when you're developing educational games because it should be very clear to the player what they need to do or what they shouldn't do, okay, and what it is that they're working, what end goal they are working toward. The same thing for you as a game designer as well. You need to be very clear when you're developing gamified and gamification that you're very clear about the objectives and goals that you want. Same for levels, the same for rules, right? You need to be very clear to the player. Um, you know, and the dynamics, like I said before, the, the the schedule, the reward schedule where points and badges are given to the players and whether you want to, you know, facilitate competing or collaborating amongst players. Um, because as humans, we have two types, you know, primarily two types of motivation. We have intrinsic motivation, which, like I said before, we're, we're naturally driven to do something. We're driven for internal reasons. We're doing it because we want to be better. We want to be smarter. We want to be, you know, be able to speak another language. And then you have extrinsic motivation, which sort of drives us. It might be money of a job. I choose, I have two jobs presented to me and I choose the one that makes more money. That's my extrinsic motivation rather than the other job, which makes less money, but gives me a better, you know, in five years time, gives me better, you know, future prospects. Um, and you can you can tap into both of these things. The problem with extrinsic motivation is that you don't want to create this situation, what's called a Skinner box. You don't want to create or a dependency on the player to keep getting those points and badges. Like I said before, if you add five points for one action, then you increase it to 10 and then you increase it to 20. The player knows that each time that they are engaging with that particular thing or they're completing that particular question, that they're going to get those points. Right, and they just keep tapping those buttons, just like the the the, the rats in, in the box, right? They kept pushing the lever to get the food. Players will keep doing that, but then over time, that gets boring. And then from a player perspective, that's when they stop engaging with that experience. All right. Again, I, I've, I've talked about this a lot as well. You really want to get and tap into those pleasure points of, of the player and really connect with them on that level to try and create a very, you know, personal experience for them too, especially in gamification, especially in educational games. You, people might not want to be there. They're doing it because they have to. They're doing it because, you know, they don't have another choice. I'm, I'm in school. I have to do an educational game or, I'm, you know, want to stop a bad habit. So how can you make this more pleasurable for them, right? How can you remove the pain point, right? How can we try and make it less, you know, punishing? How can we make it less painful for the player to engage in these things right chunking you know we can we can divide up these activities we can separate like in duolingo instead of giving the player a thousand words to look at and study and learn they divide it into thematic topics and those topics are then divided in terms of level of difficulty okay and players are rewarded so like uh, accordingly um and 
you know, you have some of these experiences as well when we talk about gamified applications or games that try to really push the boundaries of what it means to, to play and what it means to interact. The games like Actual Sunlight, which touches on the topics of depression. So I've tried to really can make that connection between empathy and understanding the player and what it's like to, to live on a daily basis with depression. Papa and Yo, again, was another very strong example of a game of, of basically an autobiographical game of a child who was telling the, the story of his, of his drunk and abusive father, which was depicted here as a, as a monster. But it's actually quite a beautiful story that does show the, the tenderness and the love between these two, right? Grizz is, is also similar to actual sunlight. It's a very emotional journey um, that also tries to really connect empathetically with the player. Papers, please. This is a very controversial game, but it's a very important one because it also challenges when we talk about themes like politics, what it is to, to engage in an immigration process. Right? It's not simple. It's not black and white. Right? Some people have legitimate motives for, for not having certain documents. Other people, not so much for trying to work the system. And this game places you in this uncomfortable position to make the morally right choice and the legally right choice. Um, and that Dragon Cancer is also another really touching game that sort of pushed or really tried to communicate a real life, a real, this is a true story, an experience with a family whose child got diagnosed with cancer and that journey that they they went on, right, to the eventual and unfortunate death of their of their son. But the, these games have this potential, right, because they really, like, challenge um, this idea of what it is to game, what it means to combine these things, and then to make the player stop and then think about this experience later on. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I think we're on time at the moment, so I'm going to finish here. But the idea is when you're thinking about gamification, I really – want to, especially if you're new to this, this era, right? I want you to try and think about what it is, what are these connections between the players that you're designing for and how it relates, right, to these goals, how it relates to the, you know, the, the objectives that you're trying to achieve. Um, games like Papers, Please really sort of connects with people. I mean, Throughout the entire world, there is this topic of immigration. What does it mean to, you know, have to flee a country under certain conditions? What does it mean to be looking for a new, new, new life, a better life? Right? And it challenges that idea in a moral way as well, because it places you in that position. You're the person at the, at the border who has the decision to let people in or not let people in. Um, and, you know, these, these tools can also be really good to illustrate topics. So, you know, if you're in an educational or an academic environment, having games like this available can really help to also connect players to what, or students rather, to what they're reading or what they're learning about, right? It helps to create more empathy in the world, which I think most of us can agree the world definitely needs a lot more empathy, you know, a lot more understanding. Right? And it helps to really break the stigma surrounding certain things like um, depression, for, exa for example, in actual sunlight. Um, another really good example is um, Center of Sacrifice. Um, it is a game that was developed by a, game, by a game studio in collaboration with psychologists that helped to really show what it meant right, to have schizophrenia. And this is another example. So all, all the, the, as you're playing that game, you know, the character, she hears voices, right? She sees things that are not there. All, all the typical things that, you know, the, 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 the invisible things that people don't see, that, that people with schizophrenia experience. And what that game achieved is it really helped to bring to light and to, to, to shine a light on these problems and try and get people to understand, right? That these, these types of experiences, they're not... You know, it's not textbook, right? You don't read about it and that's it. It's showing you actively in a game, in an immersive environment, what it's like to experience these things. So this is the power that you have as a game developer, as a, you know, someone that's designing gamification or someone that's designing educational games or serious games. You have this power to create experiences like that. And you have to be really clear and really sure about the audience that you're developing them for to really make an impact. Um, and I think for now, I will, I will stop it there. Um, 
I don't know if there are any any questions or from anybody. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, over justification, mm -hmm. as you said that yes. is the feeling that the player gets when he gets when he gets uh, satisfaction all the time. Is the reason that uh, games have the grinding part or the boring parts in order to get only a little satisfaction, not too much? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is also a very this is a hot topic because this this grinding mechanic it exists in a lot of um, RPGs like role playing games, mm -hmm. and this is also a heavily criticized thing because people are like I want to advance my character I'm enjoying this, but you know when you have to keep doing the same thing over and over again it kind of it can it can actually have the opposite effect you don't feel yes. progression you feel frustration and that's bad. Mm -hmm. so you, you need to find that that good balance between the two. Yes, it's yeah. very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. Anybody else? I mean, you can also get in touch with me, me later. I will put my contact details in the in the chat as well. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to to get in touch. No. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if now we, we, we continue with Francesco or we take a pause. Um it's okay, we can continue with Francesco. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Hello, yes. Hello. All right, so <clears throat> Very interesting what uh, uh, Lauren said. I will uh, now go through, let's say, a more um, practical in the part of, uh, of a tool called um, uh, Unreal Engine. Not sure if uh, any of you is uh, familiar with Unreal Engine, uh, but I'm going to show basically some videos and comments that over. And basically, the say the goal of this part of a presentation is to make you understand what is like the potentials of using these uh, new technologies uh, such as uh, uh, VR combined with all the consideration we already did about gamification in order to process uh, um, data, for, for example, in uh, different uh, um, field of applications so ranging from uh, uh, you know, simulation, smart manufacturing, uh, um to entertainment uh, and uh, so on and so forth so um i'm going to start sharing my screen all right so <clears throat> this is uh i don't know if you can see my screen now yes, yes we, we can, can see. see all right so this is the website of um Unreal Engine. Um, so if you if you scroll down, you will see that uh, it's used already in a, in a different variety of fields from games, uh, movies and television, uh, architecture, automotive, uh, broadcast, live events, simulations, and even more um, uses uh, cases. Um, not sure the, have any of you have heard of Unreal Engine before, or even maybe. They thought it was just related to gaming. Hey, I have heard the Unreal Engine uh, as well. I was ready to use it, but I went with Unity instead. Oh, OK, too bad. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like Unity much. Uh, no, I'm, I'm joking. I, I, I like Unity, but I would much, much, much prefer Unreal for uh, many reasons. Yes, it might be a little bit harder to use. Uh, but in my opinion, it has more potential to interconnect um, with uh, many type of applications, uh, and um, and it's let's say more uh, visual fidelity rendering. It's perfect, for instance, for uh, training data sets and uh, real um, real life conditions, uh, both you know to uh, to analyze maybe. Um, um, cardboard uh, processing manufacturing or to just uh, uh, train uh, some network uh, 
uh, some uh, machine learning, uh, so, sorry, <clears throat> to train some neural networks for, I don't know, automotive, um, uh, smart, smart cars and, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles and so on. All right, so um, as I said, it's also um, largely used in, uh, in simulation. This is the page that you find in uh, solutions uh, under simulation. So here we find, you know, it's been used uh, for training uh, pilots, uh, for training uh, doctors in virtual reality, and uh, so not only to training humans, but also to training machines. So it's very powerful and versatile tools. Uh, although, of course, it has like, uh, um, let's say, a root uh, uh, deep into games because Unreal Engine uh, was born as a game engine and then uh, it, it grew into something, uh, let's say, more. So I'm going to, to show you a series of videos and maybe we are going to comment it on top. So uh, first video I want to show it to you is uh, the state of Unreal. I'm not sure if I shared my audio. So I'm going to share again to be sure that I share with audio. All right, then you tell me if you're going to hear the audio well. Uh, hey, can you see my screen? Uh, no, you cannot see. No. Okay, give me a second. <clears throat> Not able to share the screen. Let me try to share maybe the specific uh, application. Let's see if. Uh... Okay. Do you hear the audio? Nope. No. No, no. I cannot hear. Mm, okay, it's not good. So, a second for uh, figuring this out. Francesco, there is a checkbox when you share the um, screen. Yes, but when I, I try to check this box, uh, the, the screen sharing doesn't start. I'm not able to share with audio. Okay, maybe I can do like this. This audio now. Something told me, is this thing on now? I've been working long like a member thought now. Tying up words, making them a bomb now. No, 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 no. Something told me, we turn on me alone now. I got a message, we didn't put it in a song now.
Okay, I was not sure if you heard the audio as well, because um, I had to share a single uh, screen and I cannot talk during video if I'm out. Yes, we did, we can, we hear the audio. Okay, perfect, wonderful. All right, so this was like uh, the state of Unreal in 2020 um, with the two pandemic, uh, I could not find like a more, let's say recent video, but as you can see, it ranges from uh, many uh, real-time applications, mainly focused on games. But uh, as I said, this is not only the, um, let's say, uh, the only part in which Unreal, let's say, shine. Um, so uh, this was just a general to maybe uh, make you familiar, or maybe some of you is a gamer, and if some of you is a gamer, maybe you know recognize a couple of games here and there. So I'm going to, to very quickly show you instead a very quick one minute uh, uh, size reel instead of projects that are non-game related into Unreal. And then we will deep dive into more, I'll uh, say the, the simulation and smart, uh, smart data processing in Unreal Engine. Again, this is a very short presentation anyway. So I need to, let's say the goal again is just to give you an idea and just uh, let's say to tickle your, your creativity in your brain of uh, what you probably can do maybe with uh, this type of technologies uh, uh, in your own work. And so, so I'm going to, again, uh, share the single tab for the second <coughs> video. Okay, <clears throat> so um, this was basically, again, a quick size reel of uh, Andrea in a known, uh, um, say, gaming projects. So now I um, want to basically show to you uh, four uses uh, cases, uh, always for a video. And unfortunately, when I share my screen with that, I cannot talk because I plan actually to, to talk over the video soft. Uh, um, explain more about what's going into the video, but unfortunately I cannot do that. So I'm, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to uh, show you the video and comment them afterwards. So the first um, video I want to show you is like um, a simulation developed by Dovetail Games uh, uh, about um, uh, for training uh, uh, pilots for uh, driving trains. Uh, so this is, let's say, the, the oldest one of the applications. Uh, and the, the one, let's say that, um, uh, let's say use uh, human training. So this is just an example. Then uh, the next three we're gonna use, uh, uh, and I'm going to anticipate we're gonna see it. Uh, another one, uh, we're gonna see Unreal used for uh, autonomous driving. So for, let's say training uh, uh, machines, then we are going to move uh, away and we are going to instead talk about uh, Unreal used as a digital twin probably maybe um, closer to the research fields of uh, participants here and uh, how it can be, let's say you, it's a, let's say one real use case of a digital twin. And then we are going to see also how, um, again, a second user case of a, of a digital twin 
and say in a more uh, reduced scope with the first one, but it has very nice, interesting, um, um, let's say, features uh, that might be interesting maybe to see also in uh, manufacturing, processing, and so on. So I'm going uh, with, um, with the first video. At its core, Dovetail Games is about creating experiences for enthusiasts. We talk about hobby more than we talk about games here. The basis of the company has been train simulation with lots of depth, very advanced physics, and very engaging experiences. But we moved into fishing simulation about five years ago when we first started working with the UE4 engine. It did really well and we were really happy with it. Um, a, a lot of us really enjoyed using UE4 as well. So we decided to scale it up and start using that on Trains in World. Trains in World is one of the simulations that we make here at Dovetail. It's primarily aimed at train fans, but also hoping to get maybe the casual gamer or just people that haven't ever had that interest, trying to get them in and enjoy it for the beauty that it is. So making a simulation game is a different kind of game to the traditional type. It gives you a lot of challenges in the sense that you're constantly having to think about not just I want to create something that's really detailed, but actually how would this be in real life? We have lots of rail drivers and rail operators who play our game, so we need to make sure we get it right because these are the first people who tell us if we don't get it right. Our players can sometimes tell us what we've done wrong just on the basis that the train is acting in a strange way to them, and it will turn out, yeah, we've got, we've got some very small value way back down the line wrong, and they've figured it out for us, and that's really impressive. Imagine this. You're trying to move a very, very long vehicle with independent carriages at high speeds across very large terrains. And you want to do all of that smoothly with beautiful visuals and incredibly realistic physics. What other engine are you going to use than UE4? Obviously, our levels are very, very long, um, 60 kilometers and longer. That's a huge challenge. Most games, they've got all sorts of tricks where they'll put you into a corridor while they load the next level. We can't do that. It's got to be modeled as per reality. So we had to be able to change the fundamentals of how levels are loaded and, and what order parts of the level is loaded. And we did that largely without having to change Unreal itself. Most of the functionality for that was pretty much ready to go and we just sort of plugged in where we needed. Um, and that was a real benefit for us in developing some of our more, most important features. Obviously, UE4 does a lot of the heavy lifting for us, but it couldn't do all of the jobs we needed it to do. And our solution for that was something we call Simigraph, which allows us to accurately model the physics of each of those carriages as they move independently. Our physics simulation is, I think, second to none and built totally in-house, but deeply integrated with Unreal now. Source code access to Unreal has been absolutely a boon for us. There are a number of features in our game that wouldn't have been possible without it. Changing the engine is no bigger a deal than changing our code. One of the reasons we uh, chose Unreal Engine was we wanted to bring it onto multiple platforms. We're in a state now with our build systems that once we've got our PC build happy, we can press buttons and the PlayStation and the Xbox builds fall out. Now that's not to say there's no additional work to do, but it's minor which is an amazing place to be for being multi-platform. For me, UE4 is about letting us do the thing that we're really passionate about. We talk about making real in Unreal at Dovetail Games quite a lot, and Unreal Engine's really empowered us to bring that living world to life. Okay, and now, we are moving to the uh, next video. Yes, I know basically my presentation is uh, basically just a series of videos, uh, but I thought to do something, um, uh, you know, slightly different, uh, even to break maybe the the flow of a uh, of a day. Um, so um, <clears throat> this it's about as I anticipated before, uh, autonomous uh, driving. I'm 
Thomas Guentat, an automotive domain director at uh, AV Simulation, and I will present you the amazing work we have been doing with Epic Game to develop the new scanner generation tool. So we developed Scanner, which is an open, modular and scalable driving simulation software. Scanner is a tool to simulate a virtual environment to test automotive systems. It means that we build virtual roads, virtual traffic conditions and scenario for automotive engineers that works on EDA system, headlamp, chassis, body design and HMI. We also build driving simulators, which are very big machines with cylindric screen and motion system. At the moment, we are developing the two largest driving simulators in the world, one for BMW and the other for Renault. Our aim is to accelerate and secure the development of autonomous vehicles. There are two big challenges for this incredibly complex system. The first one is that you need to make sure before putting the vehicle on the street that they will be safer than human driver. It means that you have to prove that they can perform in any day-to-day -day situation, every time of the year, any weather or traffic condition, and for every road in the world. It's such an incredible challenge that it has been computed that if you had to prove that in reality, it would require billions of miles of real driving that would take hundreds of years. Simulation is then the only solution. The second challenge is the interaction between the driver and the system. You can build a very sophisticated autonomous system. If it is not understood or trusted by the human in the car, it will be useless. Simulation is again very useful to study the driver behavior in complex driving tasks because you can study how the driver behaves and reacts to dangerous situations in a very safe environment. It means that we have to simulate not only for the driver, but for the complete perception system. And it's a much more complex task because the human brain can make adaptation to understand the difference between the simulation and the reality, but the sensor system won't. Any slight difference between the simulation and the reality will change the result. To address these two big challenges, we had to invent and develop the next generation simulation tool to immerse not only the driver, but also the complete perception system, camera, radar, LIDAR. And for that reason, we have chosen Unreal from Epic Games. Why? Because it's the more realistic and performant 3D engine on the market. It's physics-based and we need to bring trust in the simulation result. It's very complete with a full editor and very easily accessible to the final users. It also brings a very rich marketplace with a lot of high-quality 3D assets. We also found out that Unreal was very popular among our customers. We have developed a complete seamless workflow that very easily brings a high realism to our customer with their existing assets and scenarios. We have developed this very rich and very detailed environment model where you can dynamically change the time of day, the weather condition, where you can have multiple vehicles, pedestrian, animals in the scene. You can program very complex scenario from everyday life. We also have developed standard NCAP scenario test with our partner Utax Serum that behave exactly like the one on the test track. We also have developed an automotive camera sensor model that generate photorealistic images and exhibit exactly the same default that the real camera. That really allows to verify how your perception system will behave in any complex situation. We also provide a more advanced workflow for advanced users that have development skills to completely customize and enrich their rendering. We also have a very complete roadmap to improve the environment creation, to integrate all the sensor models and to move our headlight simulation tool to Unreal. With this new solution, our customer can recreate super realistic simulation environment that they can use to perform their validation test and prove that their systems are safe. This is really a strong accelerator for them and it will bring autonomous systems in the street sooner than expected. Well, thank you very much for listening and I wish you a nice event. Okay, um, again, it's like uh, not great uh, that uh, I'm basically just uh, showing uh, videos without being able to, let's say, talk over the videos there. But um, 
yeah i have like uh two more uh videos uh maybe uh the next one i'll still share with the audio maybe the last one i will share with the audio, audio and uh, maybe try to to talk over it so um so at least we have a general idea Hi, I'm Yan Jie from Vows. We are a design agency based in Singapore. Vows is an assemblage of architects, programmers, and game designers. We use game engine in the architecture and built environment sector on a wide range of projects, ranging from residential to commercial and even to heritage. Our projects are often tailored specifically to the needs of the client, and we deliver from the conceptual stage all the way to development of the, of the software, as well as maintenance of the project after it's completed. Today, I'm very happy to share with you our project with Changi Airport Group, the Changi Airport Digital Twin. Vows has always been a partner of Changi Airport Group since 2017, and we developed a digital twin of Changi Airport over the past few years together with Mr. Ao Ching Wen and his colleagues from T5 Planning. The digital twin is around 1,300 hectares, and that is roughly the size of 3,200 football fields. Our approach to digital twin is to build a data integrated model. We stream in live operational data into the 3D model, and we use that as a base to develop applications for different end users of the airport. The reason that we chose Unreal Engine is because of its ability to provide real-time graphics, but at the same time, we can integrate with back-end databases, and this allows us to scale with the size of the project. Throughout the two-year period, we deployed to different platforms and applications from the same project file. The base model was built based on CAD and BIM information. The 3D models are constructed modularly and assembled in Unreal Engine to take advantage of the many optimization tools often used for open world games. This includes instancing as well as the foliage tools. This is important because on a project of this scale, your performance is key. Using georeferencing, we align the model with real geo coordinates that allows for integration with sensors and data. With blueprints, we build integrations with the Changi backend databases that streams in live data and projects them onto the model in real time. To talk a bit more about the technical details, let me invite the next speaker, Poon Hei, who is our senior developer of Vows. Hi, I'm Poon Hei, a senior software developer at Vows, talking about our application which uses aircraft transponder data to visualize the position and movement around a digital scale model of Changi Airport in Unreal Engine 4. The application can display plane position and additional information in real time, relayed from a server in the airport. It also allows users to play back historical simulation records transmitted from the server itself or from records stored in a local database. Going forward, our future plan is to integrate as much information as possible into the application to serve as a central hub of information for monitoring purposes, such as arrival and departure times at each gate, human traffic counters, temperature and humidity sensors, and so on. Thank you, Poon That was an example of deploying the digital twin on a macro scale. On a more micro scale, we investigated the road and traffic infrastructure from the angle of the actual user by de deploying the digital twin onto a driving rig. We showed that a detailed level can be achieved with ground level signage and markings. With this, end users such as technical staff and operators of the airport who may not be familiar with architectural drawings can be engaged to test out the digital twin. This opens up opportunities with the complex tools that Unreal provides to build scenario training and design validation applications. This is especially important in today's world where digitization and remote training become increasingly important. The digital twin is currently deployed internally in Changi Airport. It is meant to be a live model, which is consistently updated with new content and features. This project serves as a foundation for Changi Airport Group to continue exploring digital transformation in the domain of airport planning, simulation, and operation. Thank you for listening to my presentation. I wish you a pleasant evening and please enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, we just saw also how Android can be used uh, for modeling uh, digital twins. And um, as you all know, digital twins are very important uh, in uh, the last uh, years of research, because with uh, this type of technologies and the stream of uh, data, it can uh, be applied and used in uh, many, many, um, I would say, uh, fields of applications. 
Um, so I'm going to show you this time. I'll try to share without audio. So in this case, I should be able. To, you should still be able to hear my voice and see my screen. Um, so uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay awesome. Yes. Um, so this is a one uh, one last uh, digital twin uh, model of um, an office in uh, Stockholm, and. Uh, Basically, there is like a, this is the, the basic uh, 3D model of uh, let's say an environment that is very simple, in which then we stream in live data. So this is like a depth cameras, and uh, they stream live data from the depth cameras, which are then uh, combine all the depth cameras and uh, let's say build a point cloud in the environment, uh, which is uh, somehow live, so we can see uh, 3D representation of what's going on. In, uh, in in the office, um, of course, uh, um, it can be streamed a different type of uh, of data, such as uh, here it shows like uh, the temperature sensors of the airflow, and uh, then uh, the, the software can also run uh, simulations, make predictions, uh, as well as just monitoring the current uh, say situations, uh, and in case you know we're launching warnings. Uh, and uh, so this is also part of um, of a field that's called, you know, uh, smart monitoring. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so basically, uh, all of this can be um, easily achieved by using one of the real-time uh, um, rendering uh, engine, such as uh, uh, Unity, as you mentioned before, but also uh, Unreal. So um, uh, today's presentation uh, wasn't meant, let's say, to, um, uh, to, to at least my part wasn't meant to uh, explain something, but just really to tickle your creativity and say, look, there is these new technologies uh, and uh, they are very advanced. They can be used in many different fields, uh, um, in fields that maybe um, you never thought of before uh, the cyber technology can enter into. And, um, and since now these tools are like very accessible to, to everyone, um, I really would like to invite you all to try them out in your own field research, even if that seems that maybe a little bit separated from, uh, from all of this, but, um, but it can be really, uh, really, let's say a um, game changer. And um, yeah, this is, uh, this is it. Um, Sorry if the presentation was short, it was just a, a series of videos. Um, but um, uh, yeah, we had like some uh, technical difficulties. Um, just uh, just let me know if you have any questions uh, and uh, I'll be pleased to, to answer. We have a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, hi, thanks for an interesting video. So this project is uh, based on real normally the dualism is between real or unity. However, unity projects can be put online. Uh few as well for Unreal, I don't know. I think that using real resources to Unreal is more complicated and you need to put on a private system. Do you know if there is any online resources to do for Unreal too? All right, so um there are uh for Unreal there is a possibility, uh there is a um, community-based plugin to build an HTML5. Uh, so it can actually be put online. Although Unreal developer uh, like uh, a proprietary technologies that uh, is still publicly available in the engine called uh, pixel streaming, uh, that is uh, more like um, uh, similar to Google Stadia. So instead of uh, really rendering the applications on the, on, the, on the browser, which is very limiting, you are rendering the whole applications in real time on the server and you are going to stream just the pixel data. So you just like a video stream and that you are going to stream back the inputs from the user. Uh, using this technology, you can uh, achieve really high fidelity 4K renders, uh, um, even on a simple computer who do not have any graphical uh, card, any, any you know, dedicated graphical card. And uh, so this technology is, uh, let's say, very, um, uh, very important if you want to keep uh, the high fidelity quality. Uh, again, otherwise there is the HTML5 based community plugin, 
or the alternative, there is some uh, third party tools uh, that uh, you can buy that allows you to uh, put Unreal onto, um, onto the cloud and rendering on the web. Um, although again, uh, once you do so much to actually reach uh, this high level of, um, of quality, um, I would either go with like an install application or with using pixel streaming, um, which again, yes, it has a, a little bit higher cost on the server side since the server needs to render. Uh, but um, in the long term, you are going to deliver um, very high um, end results in terms of graphics. Not sure if this uh, answer your question. Hi, uh, I'm Paolo Fazzini. I'm the one that actually posed this question. Uh, yes, so you're talking about uh, server-side uh, rendering. And um, mm -hmm. so one thing I didn't catch uh, is, uh, because I, I was mentioning Furious, because Furious allows to run Unity project. Furious is a, a cloud owned by Unity, and you can do render um, server-side rendering as well and pixel streaming with Unity. And uh, actually, because it's uh, the same company, is actually very easy. You just develop in Unity, put your program there. You have all the right casting, all the advanced graphic feature uh, that you want, and then you can just do pixel streaming. And uh, for Unreal, what I don't know, because actually my knowledge is old, a little bit, a couple of years old, I think. Uh, that time when I checked uh, for Unreal, the company, as you said in your answer, uh, they prefer to build their own, their own system with a high-profile server to be able to do very challenging rendering. And uh, I don't know if there is something similar to Furious, so you can put on cloud. So you said there is something actually for Unreal. Did I get that right? Yes, there is. So, so um, Unreal provides you with the, the, let's say, the build code. Basically, it's um, a couple of Node.js servers. Uh, that uh, you can install on any server you want uh, and just do pixel streaming with your own custom server. Um, so this is the first. Second, uh, there are different services such as Azure uh, from my, by Microsoft uh, that actually um, already has a predisposition for pixel streaming servers that you can rent and install your application there. Or there is third part to manage the pixel streaming. Um, so I guess it's similar to Furious, in which uh, you give them the application and they will do all the rest. They will set up the server for you and, um, and host it as well. So um, let's say that uh, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with Furious. I didn't know about this. Uh, but let's, let's say Unreal gives you the whole source code. And, and let's say that it's, if you don't want to customize, it's basically. Uh, one click away in which you can uh, click and it builds the Node.js server and you put it uh, on any server and uh, you you just do request and the pixel streaming starts out of the box. Otherwise, you can go into more uh, semi-managed like Azure that uh, has already uh, some pixel streaming, uh, um, let's say, pre-built code or supporting your infrastructures. Let's say that there's like modifications of this Node.js server to handle uh, certain features already, or you can just go with, uh, I guess, similar to first, uh, some uh, third-party companies that manage it for you. Uh, I'm not sure if this answers your question. I, th I think I think you did. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I have a little question as well. Uh, can Unreal used for NFT games? And because I saw that Unity already has some plugins for it. Uh, yes, Unreal has some um, plugins for NFTs, um, even the marketplace. Um, also, because uh, Epic Store um, said that they are open to any type of NFT games, uh, despite uh, being, um, um, uh, let's say, not so well received from the general public. Um, so yes, there is, uh, let's say there is not a built-in support yet, um, but there are many plugins, uh, already out there and, um, and they are also welcoming them on, on their store and marketplace. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, we can continue with our next presentation. Thank you very much professors for your very interesting presentation.
Uh, Thank you're very, you very welcome. much for the opportunity. Like with uh, Lauren, I will uh, leave in the chat my contact details in case some of you wants to get in touch or want to know more uh, about Unreal. Thank you very much. Uh, so our next presenter uh, is Andrea Nicolaou, which is a PhD candidate from the Uni University of Cyprus. Andrea, Hello, when Andrea. you are ready. Hello. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can share you as well. Good morning for me. Um, my name is Andrea Nicolaou. Uh, I am a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Cyprus. And I'm going to present you a study based on the field of biomedical engineering uh, with title, uh, Rule Extraction in the Assessment of Brain MRI Lesions in multiple sclerosis. Um, I will begin by mentioning the objective of the study. Then I will present the methodology and the results of the study. Uh, I will conclude. And finally, I will suggest future work. The objective of the study it was the um, extraction of explainable information in the form of rules uh, for the assessment of brain MRI lesions and their interrelation to disability in multiple sclerosis subjects based on texture features. The flow diagram illustrates uh, the different processing steps investigated in this uh, work, which are MRI acquisition, intensity normalization, and manual lesion delineation texture feature extraction, classification analysis, and rule extraction. Uh, I will talk further about these steps in the next slides. To begin with, uh, multiple sclerosis is a chronic disease affecting the two main structures of the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord. It is characterized by autoimmune inflammation, demyelination, and axial damage. The pathological hallmark of MS is the appearance of white matter lesions that are caused by the immune system attacking the myelin sheath around axons. The lesions uh, are visualized by magnetic resonance imaging MRI, and evaluated by expert neurologists following the McDonald criteria. The neurologic impairment is assessed at each MRI scan using the expanded disability status scale in DSS from zero to 10, um, which defines the disability progression. The most common MRI pulse sequences used to detect uh, MS lesions and assess the inflammatory activity are T1 weighted, T2 weighted, uh, protondesine weighted, and fluid attenuated invention recovery, or FLARE. Um, these brain MRIs illustrate um, the MS lesions with the red circle. And as we can see, uh, the MS lesions are not very visible, uh, and that's showing the difficulty of the problem. In this study, we are used 38 subjects with a clinically isolated syndrome of MS, and the MRI indetectable brain lesions were scanned twice uh, with an interval of 6 to 12 months using T2 weighted pulse sequence. MRI scans were subjected to an indexed evaluation 10 years after the initial diagnosis to quantify future disability progression. 
The subjects were separated into two different groups. Uh, the first group with an index uh, score um, smaller than equal to 3.5, and the second group with an index uh, greater than 3.5. MRI images were intensely normalized using histogram normalization. And uh, then manual and lesion delineation was performed by an expert neurologist. There are features extracted from all manually segmented MS lesions detected from membrane MRI scans and were then estimated by averaging the corresponding values for all lesions. Uh, there were nine different groups of texture features uh, that are here that were taken from the Luis Vidal study. Texture classification modeling was used to predict in this score at year 10. Uh, the models were developed to predict subjects with an NDSS as smaller than equal to 3.5 versus those with indices greater than 3.5 based on texture features and lesion images. Classification models were implemented on the K9 analytics platform using decision trees. The table here shows the subject distribution from training uh, and evaluation of the classification models. The initial data set uh, was 38 uh, subjects, 29 of them belong to group one, Nine of them um, belong to group two. Data were split into a training and an evaluation um, group using 80% for the training and 20% for the um, evaluation step. Oversample technique was used to create a new sample system for the minority group of the model in group two uh, with the same statistical properties. On the right, we can see uh, the lesions of a patient with an index uh, smaller or equal to 3.5, and um, a patient, the lesions of a patient with an index greater than 3.5. Here we can see the canine workflow. After splitting the data, oversampling the technique uh, in the training set and the performing the classification model um, using decision trees. The extraction of the lesion texture feature rules uh, was achieved uh, using the decision tree to rule set K9 node, which converts uh, the decision tree to a set of rules. The synthetic minority oversampling technique um, it was applied during the training model using the small node here to improve the performance of the model and avoid overfitting. This mode creates uh, new samples for the minority group, um, as I mentioned before, with the same statistical properties. Um, the parameter optimization uh, nodes were also added to check the minimum numbers of records per node in the in decision tree and return the one with high accuracy. Um, the table shows the results of the model analysis. It is worth mentioning that the, the models were evaluated for 10 and 20 iterations. The values on the left represent um, the valuation on 10 iterations and the values on the right represent um, the valuation uh, at 20 iterations. We can see that the feature groups, um, GLDS and GTDM, LTM, FPS and SP at time zero. And the feature groups, uh, SF, GLDS, NGTDM, LTM, FPS, and SP at time zero and time six to 12 may be used to separate um, subjects into, into the two different groups, group one, 
versus group two. Uh, the selection of the East Fixtures groups uh, was achieved using models with an accuracy greater or equal to 0 0.65. This table indicates the summary of the rules extracted. By selecting the model with an accuracy greater or equal to 0 0.65, uh, this may provide the best rules to assess um, the brain MRI lesion feature features in multiple sclerosis. It is worth uh, mentioning that some of the texture features, for example, the strength, uh, from the NGTDM feature group are strong enough to differentiate subjects into the two uh, groups as both at time zero and time zero, time six to 12, um, have exa exactly the same rule. Some uh, texture feature groups um, as we saw, at time zero can achieve very good accuracy. Simple rules, including even one texture feature group, can achieve an accuracy that is greater um, than 0 0.7. So uh, when we combine the rules of texture features, we will have very good results. Future work uh, will incorporate an argumentation based reasoning framework to build explainable AI modeling using Orgias. It is expected that this new model will provide further information on multiple sclerosis diagnosis and progression. It will include an integration of lesion uh, texture rule uh, displayed together with a visualization of uh, the 3D reconstructed brain MRI where. MS lesions were segmented based on a semi-automated CNN system and uh, will investigate further uh, MS data to enhance the validation of results and we hope to establish the clinical use of the proposed system. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. If anybody has any questions. Yes. I've got a question, if uh, if I can. Of course. Uh, yeah, Paolo Faccini here, and thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I've got a doubt on your, your classifier. Uh, I don't know if I missed some uh, specific features. In that case, I apologize in advance. But I've seen that you mentioned uh, convolutional neural network among uh, future work. I was wondering in, if in the decision tree, which is implemented right now, is there any machinery to exploit uh, eventual correlation among uh, neighboring pixels or the input of your classifier is just uh, a pixel uh, every time? So just one pixel is used. Um, do you mean about the CNN of the future work or the or the work I, uh, yeah, of, the, I, I, of the decision trees that I mentioned now. Yes, the, the, the one you just don't know. I know that convolutional neural network, you can actually exploit that, so the correlation, but I don't know if you already put on some kind of machinery to exploit this uh, in your present project. So okay. that was actually my question. Now we use the um, uh, features of, uh, of the lesions where, okay. um, where uh, the above the grayscale uh, pixels of uh, the image. Okay, so uh, every pixel uh, provide a, a series of features that are the input of your classifier. Did that, that got, did I get yes, that yes. right? Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, it looks like we don't have any other questions. 
Uh, now we'll continue with a 10 minute break and then we'll continue with our next presenters. Thank you very much for your attendance. See you in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you for holding on. Our next presenter for today is Mr. Nemanja Borovic, which is a PhD candidate from the Geronimus Academy of Data Science. Nemanja, when, whenever you are ready, you can start with your presentation. Yes, <clears throat> hello, uh, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, let me see. Uh, Yes, can you see my screen, everybody? Yes, you can see. Yes, uh, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nemanja Borovic. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in data engineering and AI for, for privacy. I'm a member of uh, Jade Lab of uh, Jeronimus Academy of Data Science and also a member of the responsible AI lab between uh, YADS uh, and KPN. Uh, today, uh, I'm gonna present uh, Data-driven privacy preservation uh, uh, reports from uh, Dutch uh, Telecom, uh, namely uh, KPN. Uh, the date, uh, the outline for today's presentation um, includes uh, um, some introduction to privacy by design, uh, what it means to having privacy preserving AI, and then I'm going to present uh, how we uh, preserve uh, and envision privacy preservation uh, uh, at KPN. Uh, so, in the past de decade, the rapid advancement of AI has been mainly driven uh, by big data, volume, variety, velocity, and veracity, uh, powerful graphics crossing units, and breakthroughs in deep learning, re reinforcement learning, and other machine learning techniques. Uh, driven by the introduction of the related uh, uh, legislation, which has been introduced around the world, it is a new challenge to discover AI knowledge from big data uh, while not compromising. Uh, data security and uh, privacy. Uh, this can all be summarized uh, by this uh, famous quote by Forbes that uh, uh, data privacy will be the most important issue uh, in, in the next uh, decade. Um, uh, so we have witnessed the last years, uh, the introduction of various uh, legislations around the world uh, that uh, try to balance um, the privacy preservation uh, in contrast to the data processing and data collection. All, all this man, uh, legislation mandates uh, that uh, the IT system should be privacy preserving and uh, privacy must be taken into account throughout the whole engineering process. Uh, such privacy enforcement legislations are, of course, uh, the GDPR that we have here in Europe, uh, the California Consumer Party in, in the US. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, privacy by design is an approach to systems engineering initially developed by Anne Kabukian and formalized in a joint report on privacy enhancing technologies by a joint team of the Information Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, Canada, the Dutch Data Protection Authority and uh, the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research in 1995. The Privacy by Design Framework was published in 2009 and adopted by the uh, International Assembly of Privacy Commissioners and Data Protection Authorities in 2010. Privacy uh, by Design calls for privacy to be taken into account throughout the whole engineering process. Uh, the concept is an example of value-sensitive design, uh, meaning that taking human values into account in a well-defined uh, manner throughout um, uh, the process. Uh, throughout the years, Kabukian's approach to privacy has been criticized as being bad, challenging to enforce its adoption, difficult to apply certain disciplines, or well prioritizing corporate interests sometimes over consumers' interests and placing insufficient emphasis uh, on um, minimizing data collection. Uh, however, it has been the cornerstone for every legislation that has been uh, introduced, uh, as previously so. Uh, GDPR incorporates privacy by design, and privacy by design is the unanimous, has been a un unanimous starting point 
for uh, developing privacy preserving uh, business solutions. So after introducing these main principles of uh, uh, privacy by design, uh, uh, we had to see how this is realized uh, practically uh, when it comes uh, to preserving uh, privacy within uh, the IT systems. Uh, for that, um, the privacy enhancing technologies or privacy models or privacy preserving techniques, all those, uh, all, all, all these um, terms uh, has been found in the academic literature, uh, have been developed uh, in order to realize privacy preservation within uh, IT systems. So let's have a look at some of them. Uh, differential privacy uh, is one of the most uh, popular ones. Uh, is a mathematical definition of privacy. With, with this uh, definition, it's possible to quantify exactly how secure or anonymous uh, data <coughs> the, di the data is within a data set. Anonymous means that a person or a group can uh, no longer be identified. If an analyst works with such a data set, it's not longer possible for them to identify individual persons, uh, but uh, will only receive approximate statistics. Giving a mathematical proof of privacy was something entirely new in information science. Imagine it like in, uh, inventing a car that's 100% safe and uh, can cause accidents. It's very much understandable that a lot of people are enthusiastic about this concept. In general, all privacy enhanced technologies are dealing with a trade off between prevention of information uh, disclosure and data utility. The same stands for uh, differential privacy and the parameter epsilon. The problem is uh, uh, that uh, when you use truly random noise to anonymize your data, every time you query the same data, you reduce the level of anonymization. Uh, this is because you are able to use the aggregate results to reconstruct the original data by filtering out the noise uh, through averaging. Um, the value epsilon is then used to determine how strict uh, the privacy is. The smaller the value, the better the privacy, but uh, worse the accuracy of the results by analyzing the data. That also means the smaller the value of epsilon, the fewer times you can access the data, uh, because otherwise you would be able to reconstruct the noise and, uh, and ultimately the anonymized data. The trick to all this is that you can exactly define how much of your privacy budget you can use till the data is not considered as anonymous anymore. As an example in the picture on the right, you can see how a low parameter uh, of epsilon has more privacy and the results range from 0 to 5 to 1.4. The higher value of epsilon, the more accurate uh, the results, but the privacy um, uh, gets worse. Um, in real life scenarios um, and also uh, during uh, the academic literature, uh, uh, the values of epsilon that are regarded uh, as strongly anonymous are considered between 0 0.1 and uh, 1. Uh, unfortunately, deployments that honor a composability and the value of epsilon are generally regarded as strongly anonymous, allow only a small number of queries, uh, maybe a few. Some mechanisms, uh, in, uh, for instance, Google and Apple manage to avoid comfort composability by making assumptions of the lack of correlation between attributes and for the same attribute over time. As a result, the number of queries they can uh, make are, are unlimited, but the noise is high. And the ability uh, to, for an instance, observe correlations between attributes is lost. While these drawbacks are acceptable for specific uh, applications in Google and Apple, most analytic tasks require less noise and more query semantics. Uh, as a result, many implementations of differential privacy have an epsilon of well over 10, and the privacy of the user in a data set is not uh, necessarily private. Uh, on the other hand, a mechanism with small epsilon will remove almost the entire information value. Moreover, the mathematical proof uh, that a, a mechanism is uh, actually differential uh, private requires extensive ex expertise. Therefore, it is no coincidence that only companies with very high research expenditures use it uh, with a published epsilon, as you can see on the table on the right. Uh, while uh, uh, differential privacy was originally created to allow uh, one to make generalizations about the data set without revealing any personal information about any individual, uh, the theory has adopted to preserve uh, data privacy within the deep learning systems 
uh, with the introduction of differential private stochastic gradient uh, uh, descent. And uh, also, it is found in the Pate packets. Um, the next class enhanced technology is homomorphic chain description. <clears throat> it was introduced uh, uh, well long ago uh, in 1978 by Rivers Haldeman and uh, the Fusos. Uh, it's a typical public uh, key cryptography, which uses an algebraic system which allows performing a variety of computations on encrypted data, which is, of course, successfully uh, used in uh, machine learning and deep, le and deep learning. The intuition behind it uh, is like imagine it like a glove box where um, uh, we are holding the key and we only have uh, the access. Uh, to view what is in the glove box, uh, uh, but everybody can put their hands inside and play with whatever uh, is inside the glove box, but only we can get the result. Uh, there are three uh, variations of uh, uh, homomorphic encryption, namely partially homomorphic encryption, what homomorphic encryption, and fully homomorphic encryption. With a fully homomorphic encryption scheme uh, allowing a large number of different types of evaluation operation on the encrypted message with unlimited number of times. Uh, the use case of homomorphic uh, encryption uh, has been found in private uh, search, in encrypted databases, on computation on the cloud, and on online voting. Uh, the main limitations are, are the slow computations. And uh, it's not feasible to use uh, homomorphic uh, encryption uh, for multiple users. If we have, for example, a database which would need multiple users to access, we would need to create a separate database for every user which is encrypted using the user's public key. This would become impractical if the number of users increases or the size of the database uh, increases. Um, the next privacy enhancement technology, which is widely used, is secure multi-party computation. Uh, protocols for secure multi-party computation enable a set of parties to interact and compute a joint function uh, of their private inputs uh, while revealing nothing to the output. Uh, the most basic properties of a um, multi-party computation scheme uh, uh, are privacy, meaning that no party should learn anything more than uh, it is uh, its prescribed output and um, uh, correctness. Um, uh, each party is guaranteed that the output that it receives is correct. To continue, for example, in the uh, uh, example of the uh, auction, uh, this implies that the party with the highest bid is guaranteed to win and no party, including the auctioneer, can influence that. Uh, the, uh, unlike other, um, privacy enhancing technologies seems secure multi-party computation uh, assumes that adversaries may be part of the system. However, uh, the uh, it must be guaranteed that the independence of the outputs, uh, namely the corrupted parties, uh, must choose their inputs independently of the honest parties' inputs. Uh, this property is crucial in a sealed auction, for example, as we said. Uh, where bids are kept secret and uh, parties must fix their bids independent of the others. The guaranteed uh, output delivery for output, uh, corrupt parties should not be able to prevent honest parties from receiving their output. In other words, uh, uh, the adversaries should not be able to disrupt the computation by carrying out a denial of service attack, for example. And of course, fairness, uh, the corrupted parties should receive their outputs if and only if the honest parties also receive their outputs. Uh, the scenario where a corrupted party obtains output and an honest party does not, uh, should not be allowed to occur. Um, uh, main drawbacks uh, of uh, uh, the secure multi-party computation is computational overhead. Random numbers must be generated in order to ensure uh, the security of the computation and high computation costs between uh, the players. Uh, secret sharing involves communication and connectivity between all participants, which leads to higher communication costs as compared to plain text compute. Uh, next, uh, privacy enhanced technologies for federated learning, a technique where an algorithm is trained across multiple uh, decentralized edge devices or servers holding uh, local data samples without exchanging them. 
practically its own device, uh, machine learning, deep learning. The main characteristics is that uh, the data sets are heterogeneous, meaning each device has its own data to be trained. And uh, this is also uh, can vary feature wise and volume wise. And also the participants' computational cap uh, capabilities may be different. Uh, we may have a server and also we may have simple uh, um, mobile uh, cell phones participating in a federated uh, learning scheme. Uh, the main advantages is that the training data is kept local. Uh, it has been proven to be uh, faster when it comes to real-time prediction. And also federated learning re uh, reduces the amount of hardware in infrastructure uh, required since uh, the participants can be even simple. Uh, uh, the, ed uh, the edge devices can be even simple cell phones. Uh, the main challenges is uh, communication efficient uh, methods, uh, sometimes low numbers uh, that of devices participating, uh, and also uh, communication of model updates uh, still uh, can preserve privacy sensitive information. So uh, an encrypted channel is mandatory uh, in order uh, to preserve any uh, revelation of uh, privacy sensitive information. Uh, so uh, after presenting to those uh, privacy enhancing technologies, we would see what it means uh, to have a, a perfectly privacy preserving uh, data pipeline according uh, the most recent academic uh, research. Uh, basically, it's a challenge to address perfectly privacy preserving AI solutions. The main characteristics of such pipelines um, is that the selection of privacy enhanced technologies is highly coupled with the use case. And the single privacy preserving technique uh, seems to be not sufficient. So there are uh, four main focal points to consider, uh, namely training data privacy, the guarantee that a malicious actor will not be able to reverse engineer the training data, uh, the input and the output privacy, uh, uh, meaning that the guarantee that the user's input data cannot be observed by other parties and the guarantee that the output of the model is not visible by anyone except of the user whose data is being inferred upon. And uh, last, model privacy, the guarantee that the model cannot be stolen uh, by a malicious party. It has been noticed uh, that uh, reverse engineering uh, uh, models to reconstruct the trading data is uh, possible and sometimes uh, uh, not even challenging. Uh, so, in order uh, to preserve privacy within uh, the training data, uh, the solution that we can suggest is homomorphic encryption and differential privacy. But regards input uh, and output privacy, users' uh, data must not be accessed by other parties, including the model creator, and the output of the model should not be visible to anybody but only the user whose data uh, was used for training. This is very related also to security uh, of the uh, system. Uh, however, solutions that can address the input and the output privacy can be homomorphic encryption, multi-party communication, and federated learning. And finally, uh, the model privacy guarantee that the model cannot be stolen by a malicious party. Uh, a model can be either stolen or a reverse engineer. Uh, there are also examples in academic literature where uh, almost 90% of uh, training of the training data uh, was able to be reconstructed just by using uh, uh, the, the model update gradients. Uh, so uh, solutions to address that is, have, have been homomorphic encryption and differential privacy. So satisfying all four uh, focal points uh, can be a combination of homomorphic encryption, differential privacy, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy, a setup of federated learning, differential privacy, and secure multi-party computation, or federated learning with homomorphic encryption. Uh, the key takeaways uh, is that privacy design principles must be respected, otherwise not privacy preserving. First model must uh, be employing data pipelines in order to preserve data privacy. There's no best option when selecting privacy models. It depends given the case. And the academic literature suggests that every privacy preserving AI pipeline is highly coupled with the use case and employs at least 
to uh, privacy enhancing technologies, uh, some suggested literature, and then we move to the KPN use case, uh, preserving privacy in the business world. So uh, Yads and KPN collaborate, and this is uh, realized uh, with a responsible AI lab. Uh, the goal of the AI, responsible AI, AI lab is to develop business solutions which are uh, able to contribute to the technical and legal aspects of transparency. Uh, the data engineering approaches that ensure privacy by design and personal and responsible offerings through text analytics and responsible applet modeling. KPN offers val va uh, various uh, services, uh, fixed telephony, mobile telephony, internet services, television. It is important for cust uh, uh, KPN customers that these services should be personal, simple, and reliable. And we constantly look uh, for ways to improve them. Uh, the privacy policy at KPN is, of course, we comply uh, with the GDPR ensuring uh, data security and local data processing. Data security uh, is realized by end-to-end -end encryption, a limited and authorized access only to the necessary personnel, uh, multiple authorization options for individuals and businesses. Uh, the data processing legal grounds uh, are uh, the, the necessary for the performance of the agreement, pro, uh, provision of service, network planning, etc. Implementation of a legal obligation, legitimate interest, and of course, the very consent of the customer for marketing and sales. Uh, KPN processes personal data, traffic data, and location data in order uh, to help their customers uh, to provide better services and also to comply with statutory retention and delivery obligation uh, to the competent uh, authorities. Uh, as part of the KPN CRM and analytics, uh, um, um, as a member of that of KPN CRM analytics team, uh, we uh, drew up reports and analyze uh, and develop customer insights that help the organization in improving its uh, services. Uh, uh, we are more or less 20 uh, members, which involve data scientists, data engineers, and machine learning engineers. Uh, the projects that we really um, do are related to customer contact analytics, chats, calls, emails, uh, mostly uh, natural language processing, and addressable TV tar uh, for targeted advertising. Uh, given a piece of data, uh, there is a classification. Uh, uh, there are data which are non-personal, uh, which are regular personal, and also spe uh, special personal data which is not processable. The main questions that we need to address uh, are what kind of data are in question and what is the purpose of processing. Uh, everything is, of course, determined in KPN's privacy policy. Every KPN unit makes sure that privacy policy is applied. Uh, regarding regular personal data, there is an opt-out. Uh, data is processed unless customer opts out. And in some cases, there is an opt-in. Uh, customer must explicitly agree for uh, data processing. In both cases, the customer uh, transparent is informed transparently and sufficiently. And KPN makes sure that the customer decisions are enforced throughout the whole organization. Uh, for personal data, there is, of course, a retention period. So we remove any privacy sensitive information. And this way, uh, data is analyzed uh, better, which results in more accurate models. Uh, Data processing principles for the KPN projects, uh, for example, for the customer contact analytics, customer is asked every time to opt out. And what regards the TV viewership data, uh, customer is asked explicitly to opt in uh, for processing. Um, this summarizes more or less our current streaming platform. As you can see, we have uh, three inputs via chat, email, or calls. Uh, all is transcribed into text and within the KPN data services hub, uh, the first thing that we do is the personalization, removal of any personal sensitive information. Uh, and after that, uh, various natural language processing uh, techniques are applied in order to extract insights, which will uh, be used uh, either for targeted process improvements or uh, marketing 
tasks uh, automation. Uh, so for uh, removing personal sensitive information, we have uh, developed uh, the person uh, is a package uh, for uh, removing privacy sensitive information from that text. It's a Python package and it removes uh, sensitive uh, information such as names uh, uh, and places, street names, house numbers, postal codes, phone numbers, bank account numbers, and dates. Uh, the current approach uh, that uh, this uh, library works is uh, a rule-based uh, combining uh, uh, whitelisting and blacklisting. Uh, blacklist tended to let uncommon names and names with alternative spellings through. Obtaining clean uh, blacklist to be a challenge, so white listening uh, was considered safer. All parts of text that are considered uh, non-sensitive, anything not explicitly approved is assumed to be sensitive information, e.g. a name will be a block no matter its uh, specific spelling. So the person package removes all privacy sensitive information. Uh, further data processing does not include privacy sensitive information. Uh, removal of privacy sensitive information does not decrease the data utility because uh, at the end of the, uh, the, end of the day, uh, in order to, for example, improve the process of, uh, um, uh, the, of a customer calling the call center and reporting a problem, uh, does not uh, have to do something with the person himself or herself to call. Um, and access to the original uh, data is limited to authorized personnel and protected under VPN's uh, encrypted intranet. Um, as a developer of uh, the, uh, uh, the person uh, library, uh, I do not even have access to the um, uh, uh, data, original data, and I'm uh, working only with uh, batches. So um, uh, the access is quite limited and quite protected. Uh, the current goals for this the person package is to make it more uh, robust. Uh, the main idea is uh, to uh, evolve uh, the uh, rule-based approach that we have to a name entity uh, recognition um, uh, task, which will identify uh, all the privacy sensitive information. However, uh, a name uh, entity recognition task by itself, uh, it's uh, not fully privacy preserving. So for that case, uh, we are planning and actually currently experimenting uh, with a combination of using uh, a name entity recognition tasks paired with differential privacy uh, and the actual um, uh, state of uh, trials uh, uses uh, the uh, diff privilege from uh, IBM, uh, the Opacus uh, uh, library from PyTorch, and uh, the TensorFlow uh, privacy uh, library. So the key takeaways is that KPA and GADS, uh, in the form of responsible AI lab, work together in order to realize transparent, privacy-aware, personalized, value creating business solution in a societal optimal way. Privacy by design is embedded and enforced in all KPN activities. And KPN's goals is to enhance already applied uh, privacy preserving techniques to state-of-the-art performance in order uh, to optimize offerings to KPN customers. Uh, yeah, for any questions, you can always mail me. And thank you uh, for your attendance. Questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Maurizio Lenzerini from the Department of the Computer Control and Management from Sabienza University of Rome. Uh, Professor Maurizio, when you are ready, you can start with your presentation. Okay, yes. Um, let me see. Uh, can you see me and can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good morning, I'm going to share my slide. And you should please tell me if it is okay. You can uh, see this, my slides. Yes, we can see. Okay. 
Okay, great. Thank you. So I don't, I, I mean, I think that this has been a very long warning for you guys. I hope you are, you know, still here. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying, I will try to, to be as alive as possible. Okay, so my title, the title of my talk is Query Answering and Query Abstraction Through Ontologies in Data Interoperability. So I'm going to talk about data interoperability. Um, I don't know much about your background and therefore it's not easy for me to calibrate this talk, but I hope you will uh, interrupt me at any time if you have questions, uh, any questions, and so that we can really take advantage of this um, uh, seminar. So please interrupt me whenever you like. So data interoperability, why, I mean, what is data interoperability? What well, one possible, I mean, there are many, many uh, definitions in the literature, but the one that I, somehow prefer is that is definition B here in this slide, the ability of information systems and business processes they support to integrate and exchange data, therefore to enable the sharing of information and knowledge between agents, between part of the information systems. Uh, and uh, I think you, can agree with me that in the in, in a data driven society like uh, the, the one where we live, where data analytics tasks are, are really uh, needed, interoperability is one of the key ingredients of data preparation. Why? Because data, if you want to prepare data to in order to analyze some phenomenon, probably you have to to to, to pick up data from different sources. Uh, to, you know, you have to uh, allow uh, many interoperability process to gather your data. Uh, and then, you know, after this kind of task uh, and after preparing your data, you will be able to analyze uh, your reality, your domain with the high quality data, okay? So uh, indeed, the interoperability has been uh, a, a topic, a hot topic in the last uh, years or decades. People have studied many different architectures that capture different kinds of systems, all, all systems based on the idea of uh, having several components that, that here in this picture, uh, appear as nodes and uh, several interoperability tasks that might be somehow classified into four broad classes, data independence, data integration, data exchange, and data sharing, let's say, okay? So that these are four possible abstract architectures for interoperability, each one capturing some particular aspect of this notion of data interoperability. In particular, what is data independence? It is the idea of uh, uh, using a, a, an abstract representation in order to access your data. So in this case, you have only two nodes inter that interoperate. One, uh, you know, the, the orange one, is where the data are, okay, are, where the data are stored. And the, and the other one, the blue one, is a kind of agent that try to abstract, abstract uh, your uh, data uh, to be independent, for example, from the representation or from the storing uh, schemes in order to provide the user with a sort of conceptual view of the data. So that, that's data independence. That's a, probably the most uh, uh, simple and basic interoperability architecture. The second one, you know, it takes this idea and pushes to the idea of uh, integrating and, sh and uh, uh, using more than one data sources. 
Okay, so you have now a plethora of data sources in this picture. We only have two, but in reality, you have you may have many. You have many data sources and you try to integrate the data, again, providing the user with one view that captures all the information content of the sources. So data integration is, uh, um, you know, provides the, the user with a, let's say a virtual view, okay? So it's not necessary that you store and you materialize the data uh, at the target when you do data integration. If you want to really materialize the data, so if you want to uh, move the data from the data sources to a new uh, node, then the task is called data exchange or data warehouse, okay? And in this case, you take the data from the sources and you materialize a new data source in the blue one, which represent the, 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 uh, a unified view of all the data sources. And uh, now you forget about the data sources and you use the data that you have consolidated at the blue node. That's data exchange or, uh, you know, it's also called ETL, right? Extraction, transformation and loading. Uh, a kind of architecture which is obviously used in data warehouse where you want to decouple the data sources that the, 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 the processes use, the operating processes use from the, the node where data analytics uh, uh, takes place. And the fourth architecture is the most general one. It's, a, it's called data sharing because you may have many different nodes with many different scopes and objectives and goals, and you might, uh, uh, you know, want to uh, uh, use many different paradigms. For example, you might want some of the data to be virtual, some other data, some other nodes to be materialized, and uh, you might have a, 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 a many different data sources where you take the data from. So very general architecture. This is this has not been uh, you know uh, uh, studied uh, and analyzed very much, but in principle it's a very interesting idea because many complex systems can be seen as a data sharing uh, architecture. Okay. So you see, the, in any architecture that I'm going that I showed before, you have these ages, right? You have these ages that are. Uh, the, the sign that some interoperation between nodes is going is going to happen, right? So, what are these ages? Yes, uh, is there a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Paolo Fazzini here. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, well, I'm not an expert in, in these things, uh, but I find them very intriguing. Uh, I didn't catch the uh, difference between data integration and data exchange, so the difference between the blue and the red arrows. Uh, okay. Can you make an example, perhaps? Well, yeah, okay. Uh, the blue arrow is a mapping. Actually, we will see in a, in a second what the ages are, right? But uh, put in a very simple way, an age is a, is, is a relationship between uh, the information content in the nodes, in one of the nodes, and the information content in the, in the uh, target node, okay? A very general kind of relationship, any relationship. We will see examples of this. Why, so what is the difference between blue and red? Uh, in, a, in the blue age, in the blue age, you just establish a relationship without uh, insisting on moving the data, right? Okay, so, uh, so in principle, if you, ask, if, you, if you ask a query to the blue node in a data integration setting, the answer to the question is computed by accessing the data at the sources. You don't have the data there, okay? Is that clear? Data, that's, yes, virtual. clear. that's virtual data integration. In data exchange, for some reason, you want to move the data, okay? Now you want to decouple the sources from the target, okay? And uh, in this case, uh, the age 
still represents a relationship, but this relationship is put in place because you want to move the data from the sources to the, to the target. Therefore, in principle, when you query the target, you can avoid accessing the sources, right? Okay. Yeah, thank you. No, no problem. Well, obviously, uh, if you think about it, there are advantages at disadvantages for both architectures, right? For example, one disadvantage of data exchange is that as soon as the sources change, you might you should be uh, you should be forced to materialize the new version of the data, right? Uh, in data integration, you might you might avoid in principle doing this because data are always alive at the sources. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, I was talking about this edge between nodes. And I want to go into the details a little bit uh, in order to understand what is this edge representing? Well, it is, I mean, this edge represents a relationship between uh, the data at the sources and the data at the target. And uh, uh, the, the, the most interesting and popular way to formalize an edge is by means of a so-called mapping assertion. What is a mapping assertion? Is an assertion that is constituted by two queries. One query over the source that is in, the, in, this, uh, in this formula is represented by phi, and one query over uh, the, the target, right? The target node. We, in, 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 this, in this formula, uh, this is represented by Psi. And you see the point here, there is an arrow, an arrow between the two formulas, right? This, this arrow represent an implication, a logical implication. So uh, here we have, you know, a, a first very important problem in this seminar. I don't know much about your background in logic, okay? So, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that you have basic knowledge about logic, right? If it is not the case, again, please, uh, you know, interrupt me and I will try my best to explain what I mean when, when I talk about logical notions in this, in this talk. But I'm going to assume that you know what is in logic, what, 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 what in, sorry, what implication, material implication in logic means. Alpha implies beta in logic means that you are asserting that whenever alpha is true, then beta must be true, okay? So it is an assertion that has a very specific formal meaning. Hmm? And why do we use this kind of formulas to formalize and to capture the idea of a mapping? Because in this interoperability world, the people uh, who has um, studied formula, uh, formally uh, the problems arising in a data interoperability network has come up with the idea that uh, a mapping assertion in, in its basic form is an assertion saying that whenever a certain pattern exists, in the source pattern represented by phi, then another certain pattern represented by psi uh, appears in the, in the target, okay? So that's the idea that people have used in order <coughs> to represent relationship between a node and a, between a target, and between a node, a, a source and a target. Uh, and, uh, now I'm going to, to show an example of a, of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a mapping, right? But I want to introduce some, a little bit of terminology that uh, we are going to use in this talk. Uh, the mapping, uh, 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 the various mappings are classified in three categories. Uh, one is called GAV, one is called LAV, and the other one is a combination of the two is called GLAV. Now, what is GAV? 
GAP is a special form of a mapping where the head of the implication, the target query, is simply an atom. So it's, it's a kind of simplified uh, form of mapping where the uh, formula in the target is very simple, it's just constituted by one atom. Well, let's say by one relation, you can think of a relational database in the target and say, and therefore you're just matching, you're just mapping some pattern in the, uh, of the sources to just one relation in the target. That's called GAP. Love is again a simplified form of mapping, but in some somehow in the dual uh, way, because now the simplification is on the sources instead of in the target, and therefore a love mapping is a formula where the form the, the 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 pattern at the source is a very simple one. It's just an atom again a relation. So I'm going to. Uh, so a love mapping expresses something like if a certain tuple exists in the source, then a certain complex mapping should appear in the target. Glove is the most general form, and you have a query corresponding to another query without any limitation, uh, without any of, of the limitations that GAV and love introduce. Okay. Uh, here is an example of a very simple map. Suppose you have two nodes, node one and node two. They want interoperate, and uh, the, you know, in this uh, our, in our approach, in our formal uh, approach to interoper interoperability, the first thing you have to do is to express relationship between the two nodes, between the data at the two nodes. And here is an example. The, 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 the mapping assertions that you see expresses the following property. Um, if an X exists in the source, satisfying the predicate student, or if you want the relation student, and X, Y, Z satisfy the relation grade, then something happened in the node, node two, in the node two. Hmm? And what is this something happening? Well, there exists a W in node two such that W teaches Y and X is enrolled in, in Y. Okay, so intuitively this assertion says, if a student takes you know, a certain course, the exam of a certain course with a certain grade, then there must be a teacher uh, 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 um, teaching this course and X should be enrolled in this course. Obviously, we are just expressing a relationship between two nodes, assuming in a very simple example that one node talks about student and grade and the other node talks about administrative problems in the university, like the, who teaches a course and who is enrolled in which course. So I'm assuming that the two nodes uh, you know, talks about different properties. And what we are trying to do is to, is to uh, link the properties at the node one to the, no to the properties of node two, okay? And just to, you know, to, to, to see an example of, of a data interoperability task, uh, let us see what, uh, what we can do with this mapping. For example, if we want to materialize the data, if you want to do data exchange, and therefore, in order to do that, I'm assuming that I have some of the data, right? Some data at, at node one, for example, at node one, my data tells me that Mario is a student, that Mario has a grade B for, for the course information system. Anna is a student and Anna has grade A for the course AI. If we, want, if we want to use this architecture uh, for the data exchange task, uh, for example, we can simply say that after data exchange, uh, exploiting the mapping, what we will have, we will have some data at the target. And which kind of data? Well, for example, 
teaches W1IS, well, it, there is some W1 teaching IS. Mario is enrolled in IS. W2 is another teacher teaching AI, and Anna is enrolled in AI. So you see, we have exchanged information from the data at the node one to the data at node two using a mapping. Okay. Okay, so let me see. Guys, are you still with me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 I hope you don't mind if I involve you. Okay. I, I, I really like, although it's very difficult to do it on, on you know, at, when you do, when you, when I, when I, when, when you are online, but I really like in general, uh, you know, to have, uh, uh, lectures that are alive rather than just you know uh, a, a, a talk, and therefore, if you have problems, if you have uh, questions, just go on, go ahead, no problem. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I hope that we have set up, uh, you know, uh, our our um, uh, field. Uh, in the sense that we know intuitively what is interoperability in this seminar. And, uh, but this seminar talk about a specific form of interoperability based on ontology. So my task is, is now is to discuss why is it, is it interesting to, to introduce ontology in the context of interoperability. And, uh, and what is the result of uh, introducing such uh, notion and which are the problems that you know, arise when you have this kind of uh, notion inside, you know, married with interoperability and which benefit do you have? So the main point of introducing ontology is that people have uh, always thought that interoperability should be based on some form of semantics, right? After all, I think it's intuitive uh, to think that when you when two agents cooperate, they do that on the basis of semantics, right? On the basis of the meaning of the data that should they, they, they exchange. Without meaning, one really should ask ourselves, what are we doing, right? We had just exchanged some data, but without really knowing what we are doing. And therefore, I think it's intuitive to think about interoperability to be based on semantics, which means that somehow the mechanisms used in, in the interoperability system should be based on the meaning of data made explicit somehow. Um, so one way to do this is to introduce the notion of ontology and make this notion one of the actor in the interoperability framework, interoperability architecture. This idea has produced uh, a paradigm uh, born in artificial intelligence or in, 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 in the intersection between the artificial intelligence and uh, data management. This paradigm is called ontology-based data management. The idea is that uh, uh, when you want to really make uh, the semantics explicit, you can introduce, in, you know, instead of talking about data schema, you can somehow substitute the notion of data schema with a much richer formalization, which a much richer, richer uh, um, object, which is the ontology. So when you want to do ontology-based data management in the context of data interoperability, the idea is that, the, for example, in a data integration architecture, instead of using a global schema at the target as data schema, why not using an ontology? Obviously, I'm going to talk about what an ontology is, but let's say that an ontology is a, somehow a rich representation of the domain of interest. Hmm? 
it's it's a it's a you might think of an ontology like a very rich representation of the domain where the data are. Uh, in data exchange, instead of talking about the target data schema in the architecture, why not using an ontology in the target uh, node? And therefore, in data warehousing, instead of uh, you know representing the data warehouse as a relational schema, why not using an ontology? In a data lake architecture, where a data lake, you know, I, I don't know if you are familiar with this notion, but you might think of a data lake as a sort of data warehouse where you just put data in, a, in any form uh, extracted from the data sources. Uh, why not? And, and obviously, when you do that, you have somehow to use metadata in order to make. Uh, uh, to make sense of the of the various sources that you have materialized in your target, why not using an ontology for representing the metadata? In data sharing, it, where where you have a plethora of you know interoperability task, um, uh, uh, heterogeneous interoperability task going on, why not exposing the the nodes of it, of the data as an ontology? So that's the idea of ontology-based data management in interoperability. Okay, so very simple then. Uh, I, I'm going to advocate the idea of using ontology in uh, data interoperability. But since, since I have only two hours or maybe one hour now, I'm going to talk only about one architecture, okay? Uh, they are, that I'm going back to the to the slides. Of, so I'm going to talk about only data, the data independence architecture, which is not very dissimilar from data integration. And therefore you might think of, uh, you know, my, my talk also relevant for data integration, but I'm not going to talk about the other two, okay? Only uh, the first two architectures will be the subject of my, talk in the remaining part. And essentially, I will concentrate on the first one. Hmm? In the first one, when you want to use ontology-based data management, the idea is the following. The orange node is, a, is, is an information system. Let's say it's a database or it's a set of data sources that are managed by a single organization. And you want to use an ontology in order to access and to process the data at the sources. Why you want to do that? Well, I'm going to motivate why it might be a good idea to use an ontology to manage even a single source, notwithstanding uh, you know, a, 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 a plethora of data sources and therefore notwithstanding data integration, okay? I'm going to motivate right now why it could be it could be a good idea to use ontology-based data manage, management to uh, manage one data sources or even many data sources to do data integration. So now the remaining part of the talk is the following. First, I, I, I will describe what is ontology-based data management and, and, and the motivation for introducing this paradigm. Second, I'm going to talk about two formal problems in ontology-based data management uh, uh, linked and related to qu processing queries, okay? So how do I process query, queries when I, I am in a paradigm of the uh, 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 ontology-based data management? So first of all, I, I will introduce these tasks, the two tasks, and indeed I will uh, present to you two types of tasks linked or related to processing queries. One is called query answering, which is you know, the most traditional one. And one is called data abstraction, hmm? query abstraction. And depending on the time that I will have, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the formal problems in query answering and, and, and the you know, formal problems in, and results in query abstraction. And then I will uh, conclude the, the talk. In order, you know, my goal is to 
give you an idea, a very general and broad idea of this paradigm of ontology-based data management. And if you are curious, you can go and delve into the details after my, after my talk. Okay, so why uh, using ontologies in data management in order to realize you know, the data independence architecture or the data integration architecture might be a good idea. I want to motivate and to answer the quest uh, this question by using a, a real example. Okay, it's a simplified one, but it's a real one. I was, you know, a, the witness of such an example a few years ago when I was uh, uh, working with a bank uh, um, promoting the idea of ontology-based data management. And uh, I don't want, you know, obviously I will not name any, any bank, but I, you know, it's a real one. Uh, and this is a part of the bank information system at that time. Uh, one of the main uh, uh, the table that a bank had in its database was the customer table, right? You, you might imagine that is one of the most important ones, right? And you might think of this table as uh, many, 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 many attributes. I remember something like 140. Uh, but I will concentrate on very, you know, a very, a very small portion of this data. And uh, this portion includes this uh, column, customer, customer um, code, then a timestamp start, timestamp end, ID group, flag CP, flag CF, fatturato, flag fat. So intuitively, I mean, you might think of, you know, accessing this data. And the first thing you, you know, it, it's, I think it's obvious is that now you should understand exactly which, which is the meaning, which is the semantics of each attribute, right? So first impression is that, okay, I have to talk to someone obviously to understand you know, the semantics of, of the table. And when you go into the detail, uh, the various details really become, start becoming awful. For example, you will learn that this is a code of a customer, but when the negative value when you have a negative value in the first column, that the customer represented by the row, uh, by the role is not, is not a physical person, it's a whole day. Okay. okay, then you go ahead and say, look, what is flex CP? Well, flex CP has the following meaning. S, which uh, means that the customer is the leader of the group it belongs to. Obviously, this sentence calls for the question, what is a group, right? Okay. And what is flag CF? Well, CF is a flag. Uh, notice that in, in Italian, S stands for yes, N stands for no. And S means that the customer is the head of the uh, group, is the, uh, the customer is the lead, oh, sorry. FlexCP is the leader of the group, and here is the head of the group, okay? <laughs> Obviously, head and leader have different meanings. Uh, flag fat, what is this flag? Well, the people tells you that uh, N means that the fatturato field is not valid. Therefore, sometimes if the fatturato field is valid, some other time doesn't mean anything. Okay, so I'm the, I don't want to go into the details, obviously, of this data structure, but I think that you re immediately realize that accessing this data information system is a nightmare if you don't have a clear understanding of the notions that are behind this table. And you can just uh, think of what happens if you consider instead of just the seven or eight attributes, you might consider all of them. So the idea is that an ontology-based data management approach could be useful in order to explain with a formal representation all these terms in a formal way. And therefore you might 
you might want to access not this physical table, but this repre abstract representation that uh, would uh, uh, provide you with the meaning of the various terms and with a nice conceptual schema representing the, uh, the, the, the semantics of the applications where the table is. So that's the idea of ontology-based data management. Why not building a representation on the top of the data source, a, a good representation that explains the semantics of the terms and the users can you know, access instead of accessing directly the table. So the idea is that once you have this more domain representation, probably you can use it as a means for uh, letting the user expressing the query on the basis of the alphabet of the ontology, which probably is close to it to 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 you know to the to the uh, understanding of the of the of the user, right? User might be a person or an application, right? Because also the application when when an application access the data should be based on the semantics of the data. Okay, so. In, in, in two words, ontology-based data management is a paradigm rooted on the idea of using database theory fundamentals and also knowledge representation and reasoning techniques from artificial intelligence. So, so it's really a paradigm born in the, at the intersection between data management and artificial intelligence. In particular, not artificial intelligence uh, in the sense of knowledge representation and reasoning, right? And um, the data ontology-based data management then is characterized by the following principle. In principle, you, you there is no need to move the data, right? The sources can stay where they are, and therefore, uh, in practice, you don't have to you know to to make a revolution of the of the information system because the ontology is on top of it. Uh, obviously, you have to work. Right? Why? Because you have to build a conceptual specification of the domain of interest in terms of knowledge structures. And we will use logic to do that. Obviously, I mean, the, the, the ontology is on top of the sources, but there, is, there must be some connection between the ontology and the data sources, right? And therefore, here comes into play the notion of mapping. So, that is, you know, the, the paradigm is based on establishing mappings uh, between the data sources to the ontology. Once you have done that, you can express all the services over the ontology structures and therefore abstracting from the physical layers in the data sources. So that, that's, you know, the core of the approach you somehow hide the complexity of the data sources and you present to the user uh, or uh, a, a, a semantic representation, not of the data, but of the domain. That's a key idea. You're not describing the data. You are describing the domain of interest. And how to connect the domain of interest to the data is the role of the mappings, okay? Once you have all of these, uh, you can now think of uh, um, executing the services that the users want by using the mapping and translating uh, all the services expressed over the ontology in terms of a, 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 a services expressed over the data sources, right? So there must be a translation process going on once you have this kind of architecture. Please, Paul. Hi, uh, yes, I just want to double check if uh, I'm following your path of mind. Uh, so if I understand uh, before you mentioned that example uh, that uh, with the data and there were like uh, differences between the words like uh, what is the difference between head or leader and uh, so if I understand is ontology <clears throat> I'm sorry is ontology something that uh, 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 keep this kind of uh, 
uh, differences in a language that is general. So you don't need to be in the head of the person that actually built them. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. So in other words, once you have a good representation of all the terms that are used in the table, you can forget about the physical layout of the table. If you can forget about the fact that you have a flag, right? You, why? Because you're, you, for example, you're asking, give me all, once you have you know, the definition of group, the definition of leader, and the fact that leader and head are different things, you can ask something like, uh, give me all the customers that are the leader of the group. You're not saying where the flag is S, right? You're just asking explicitly, give me all the leaders, right? Thank and you. give me all, all the leaders that, have, that are also head of the group it belongs to. So you are just, you know, making the questions and the, and the relationship uh, and the interaction between uh, your, cust your, your user and the data at a completely different level. Okay. Yes, very clear. Thank you. Not all, and 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 finally, there is also another in very important thing that we will learn uh, that we will learn uh, later on. Suppose that there is some, uh, uh, you know, uh, link between the notion of leader and the notion of head. For example, uh, there are some cases where, even though the data do not tell something, uh, the knowledge about the domain uh, might allow you to derive new information that are not present in the data. So the domain ontology could also not only is an abstraction that is very useful in order to hide the complexity of the data sources, but the ontology might, might introduce new derivation in, in such a way that the user uh, derive new information that are not explicitly present in the data sources. Okay, then we will come back to this. Yes, there is another question, I think. Uh, yes, my question is, uh, why use an ontology to map the data with the database instead of building the database in a way to be more understandable with more, with more physical language? Uh, well, there are many, many different answers to, the, to this uh, question. The first one is exactly the one that I was talking about uh, when, you, when you raise your head. Yes, I heard that. Right? Because if you still stick with the notion of simple database uh, uh, instead of an ontology, you probably miss the possibility of deriving new knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one, one answer. Second answer is that uh, uh, the database models are not very good at representing the domain. <laughs> they are good at representing data, right? Yes, so then data, then data will not be as clear and understandable. Well, I, I mean, obviously, I'm talking about in a very general sense, right? For example, if there is a database, now we, you and me, are using since uh, five years, uh, is probably, we, we have a very good knowledge about the data, right? Mm -hmm. And about the schema. So uh, building an ontology in this particular context might not be the best thing to do in the sense that the benefits are probably minor, mm -hmm. right? But if the domain is complicated, it's complex, and you are in an interoperability set setting where your user might be anyone, right? Yes. Then it becomes very important to have the possibility of using a rich language, not simply a data model. And mm -hmm. right? Think about it. You think about a data schema, a Mongo database. Are you familiar with uh, JSON? Yes. 
Suppose you now say, oh, no, 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 I know, I know, I want to use JSON for this. To me, it's a, it's a nightmare, right? <laughs> because, <laughs> because, okay, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with JSON, but it's, it's a data representation language, right? It doesn't really, it's, 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 not, it's not born in order to represent a domain. It's, it's born to represent a structure, right? Mm -hmm. I understand, yes. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, okay. Paolo, you have another question or? Uh, no, sorry, I just forgot my hand. Ah, okay. uh, that's a, typ sorry. a typical Zoom thing. <laughs> I also do that all the time. I ask a question and then I forgot to, okay, to lower my hand. Okay, good. Uh, it's already 12.15, 12, 12.15, 12, wow. Anyway. So it, let me say that uh, it is possible that I will not have the time to finish the topic, right? But I prefer to, you know, to explain the notions rather than go into the details of the technical thing. You might, if you are interested, you, you, can, you can obviously go into the details later on. Okay, so now I can summarize what is the ontology-based data management uh, uh, paradigm. It is a paradigm based on this very simple idea. We have a data sources. And if you think about it, this picture captures both the data independence architecture in data interoperability and the data integration architecture, right? Because in principle, you might have many, many data sources here and using just one ontology in order to access these data sources really so let's say addresses the problem of integrating the data and providing the user with a single view, which is by the way, based on the ontology. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, again, uh, we, we, we uh, rediscover the architecture where you have the ontology, which is a declarative logic-based specification of the domain of interest, because from now on, from now on, we will use uh, um, where can I can we find the seminar slide? I, uh, I I I really don't know, but I I mean I can I can I can uh, send the slides to 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 whoever is interested in, but uh, I don't know if there is a, a service provided by the organization about this. I don't know, really don't know. But anyway, no problem. You can ask me uh, uh, with an email and I will send you the slide, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maurizio Lenserini and uh, there are no many Lenserini in the world. And therefore, if you Google Lenserini, probably I, um, I will be e either the, one, the first one or the second one in the Google uh, answer. And you can find uh, my email. Okay. Okay. So I, I was talking, uh, I was telling you that ontology is a declarative logic based specification of the domain of interest, uh, which provides a concept of view for, for uh, clients. Data sources are, you know, are what they are. It might be, a, you know, a JSON or a relation databases or a, or, or, or a graph database or any, any data structures in principle, uh, because you might want, you, 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 might, you, you, you can in principle express the mapping between any kind of sources to the ontology. And the mappings are these assertions that semantically link data uh, at the sources to the ontology. Okay, so fortunately there is a formal a formal um, definition of, 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 a, of, a, of an ontology-based data management specification is a triple OMS, O is the ontology, expressed in, as a logical theory in a particular language, family of language, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and which is a language of description logics. They are very specific logics, so I'm going to talk to about them in the uh, soon 
S is a data schema. Now, in principle, you can use any data sources, right? But here, I'm assuming that you have as an SQL endpoint, right? That, uh, that, that federate a different schema. And therefore, I'm assuming for the sake of this uh, seminar that you have a single SQL endpoint uh, as, as a data source, okay? But this is just, just for, the, you know, for the sake of the seminar. In principle, you might have any data sources uh, to map to the ontology. And M is a set of mapping assertions. We have already seen it, right? But if for the sake of this seminar, I'm going to be more specific and more precise about the form of these assertions. In the, in the following, uh, phi is a conjunctive query and psi is a conjunctive query, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you guys, do you know what a conjunctive query is? No. Okay. No, only one no. What yeah, about no. No. no, no, no. Okay. I think it's very important that we that we understand what a conjunctive query is, and therefore, let me let me um, try to use my wonderful board here. So I'm going to um, stop sharing. I'm going to um, try to use my different board uh, camera. Can you see my board? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to tell you what a conjunctive query is by using a very simple, stupid database. You have a relation R. Can you see the, the my writing? Yes, we can see. A, B, these are the attributes of R. And this Q is another table, is another relation. I'm going you know, to talk about the relational database, but in principle, you can use any kind of relation. C, D, E are the name of this uh, attribute of relation Q. Okay, now in order to understand what a conjunctive query is, you can you should think about logic as a query language. When you use logic uh, with databases, the first thing you do is to take predicates corresponding to the tables. Now, this table R is, uh, has two columns, right? Therefore, your predicate R has two positions. So we are going to use a predicate in logic with two arguments. Why? Because you, may, you, you have to take as many arguments as the number of columns that the corresponding relation has. And therefore, Q is a new predicate, is a predicate corresponding to the other table. And this predicate will have three arguments, three positions, right? Good. Now, once you have done this, any formula in logic, using these predicates corresponds to a query over the database. Why? Well, let me do some example. I want all the X such that, uh, such that there exists the Y R X Y. Please consider this formula and tell me intuitively, if you understand intuitively, how would you 
explain the semantics of this query. What does this query compute in your opinion? Just, just looking at the formula and you know, trying simply to, to interpret the formula. Remember that this, that this, um, that this um, symbol is the existential quantification. So the formula should be read as follows. I want all the X such that there exists a Y such that X, Y, and therefore such that the tuple X, Y is in the table R. Is that right? So what, what this query computes, it computes the projection of R into the first column, right? Uh, yes, it's clear. So the, the projection of Y, right? The, the, the projection on X, the on X of on, Y, on, right? On A, on A, on the first attribute. Right, okay, of Y. Is that correct? So R is the uh, projection. No, 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 no. The no sorry. When you say the projection of a relation over an attribute, you, you, are, you are asking for that attribute. Okay, clear. So you're asking for attribute A of the relation R, right? Because you are, you are selecting X, which is in the first argument. So in the output of the query, you want X. Is it okay? Yes, clear, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, so <laughs> in this extremely simple example, hmm? Uh, you understand by means of this example that you can use logic to query your database. So my question again to you is, uh, uh, is it a new thing or you already knew that? Who, who already knew that you, in principle you can use logic to, uh, to query a database? No one? So you, I, I assume that you, you know SQL, right? Yes, by using SQL, uh, we mostly use logic. Well, actually it, that's a very interesting observation. It, SQL is not exactly logic, but you might uh, understand that behind SQL, there is some form of logic, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. But but in this in this particular case, for example, here you wouldn't you wouldn't say this, right? You would say something like select a from r, right? Yes. It's exactly right. So you see the point that there are some differences, even though SQL has behind it uh, the, the the imprinting of logic. Uh, there is a difference between the, when I say I use logic to query a database, I'm saying really I use formulas in logic uh, to query my database. Now, mm -hmm. if you push these, now let's let's consider another query, and 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 this will be a conjunctive query. Uh, now the query is different. Is Give me all X, Y, Z, hmm? such that R, X, Y, and, and, this is the symbol for and, the end, logical end, and Q, uh, Y, uh, Z, uh, sorry, uh, X, W, Q, W, Y, Z, and uh, there exists a W. Okay. 
So I'm, I'm going to read again the query because uh, so give me all x, y, z, okay, such that there exists a y, uh, a w, such that lx, w, q, w, y, z. You see, uh, this is a conjunctive query with y because the body of the query is a conjunction of atoms, okay? There's nothing that conjunction, obviously there is existential quantification also, right? right? There exists W, but after the existential quantification, there is also a conjunction and there is no or, there is nothing, there is not not, <laughs> there is no other operator than conjunction and. So that's a conjunctive query. So whenever you have in the body of the formula, a conjunction of atoms, you are using a conjunctive query to query your database. It's a class of queries in logic. Now, exercise for you. Can you please think about which SQL query or relational algebra query corresponds to this query that I have on the board. C can you come up with an SQL query uh, capturing the same results that intuitively uh, is computed by, by this uh, logical query? If you have in mind this query, can you please uh, uh, write it on the chat? Or if you can, just can tell me. I have something in mind, but it's not fully completed. Uh, what is the intuition, even though it is not perfect, but... So what we are doing here with the existential WW here? It's, I have, it's huh? end, I guess. Huh? It's end. Yeah, in the middle there is an end, right? Yes. But the fact that I'm using W here and W here. Is this is uh, where? This where? is which of which famous operation in law in uh, in uh, in relational databases I'm using here. It's like a select. A select X Y Z where. And then you need to apply the relationships. Select. X stands for A, right? Yeah. Y stands for D, and Z stands for E. So select A, D, E from, from R, Q, where? And then the relationships are and uh, no from R and Q were um, where B yeah, W W yeah no 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 where B equal C w, uh, equal C where B equal C oh yeah sorry B equal C yeah that's right and what is this it's a join oh yes it's a join. <laughs> Right? So when, when you have this uh, select from where and you have an equality in the where, it's a join. In, fa in, in fact, if you think, if you remember SQL, you might also write select ADA, ADE from R join Q on B equals C. Right? So a, a conjunctive query is a logical form for, a, well, it's a logical formula that surely capture the join, right? But more generally, I, you, I can, I can, I can uh, um, prove that uh, 
A conjunctive query can capture all SQL query of the form select from where, in the case uh, where I don't have, a, I only have equality in the where. So any select from where with equality in the where, okay? So it's actually a, a very interesting class of queries. Well, why I'm saying that? Well, because there are many, many studies that says that from a practical point of view, something like 85% of the queries that are running right now in the world, as, as SQL queries, are of, of the form select from where with equalities. So in some sense, people have argued that conjunctive queries are you know, the most popular way to express in logic the most popular queries in SQL, okay? Good, so why did I do that? Well, because, we, because uh, now we will, we will realize that on, an ontology is a logical theory. And therefore, when we want to, to, to query the ontology, we should use logic. And therefore, we should use, in principle, we can use the simplest form of queries for an ontology is the conjunctive query. Which again, I'm going to define a conjunctive query as a logical formula where only I have existential quantification and end in the body. Very simple, okay? Very simple, but sufficiently power, powerful to capture the basic form of select from where in SQL. Okay, I'm going to uh, share again, change my camera. This is the board that I use when I do, when I, when I, have, when I lecture from home, okay? It was a very nice uh, shopping move that I did at the beginning of lo the lockdown last year. Okay. Uh, okay, guys. Now, I think I have only the time to uh, make an example of an ontology-based data management specification, okay? And, and therefore we will finish our seminar with only, you know, some ideas about this paradigm. Again, I think that what, if you are interested, uh, I am available, okay, to discuss with you, first of all, and also to provide you with some material about this uh, notion. Anyway, uh, now we have uh, the, uh, you know, the idea that we can use logic uh, uh, to express the ontology and also to query the ontology, right? And uh, let, let me really express, uh, let me really show a very simple example that might help you to, to, to grasp the idea of an ontology-based data management. Suppose you have a federated source schema, which is, you know, the collection of three data sources. One is D1 with two attributes, SSN and uh, project name. And you know, right? You know from the, from, from, the, from the interview of the experts of the information system, you know that this table stores employees and projects they work for. So every row, every tuple of this table <clears throat> says something like employee with, with social security number X is working with, pro, uh, you know, on project uh, with, with na whose name is uh, Alpha. Then you have a source D2, uh, and you know that uh, this table represents employees code with their salary. 
notice that now in table two, employees are represented by codes, not by social security number, by internal codes of the organization. Hmm? That's, it's an example, but the aim of the example is to at least to capture some complexity that you might have when you integrate the data, right? For example, a typical thing that might happen is that within a certain source, um, employees are represented in a certain way and in another source are represented in a different way, right? And this, in this example, this is captured by this difference between the social security number and code. And suppose that you have another source that fortunately uh, put in place some correspondences between the codes and the social security number. So for some of the employees, not for all, or at least you are not ensured that for all this happens, but for some employees, you have the correspondence between the code of the employee and the social security number, okay? So you have three data sources in this very simple example. But the domain of interest is represented by an ontology. And the ontology is on the left here. Uh, you find in the picture both a graph, a diagram of the ontology and the axioms in a certain logic. I, obviously, I do not, you know, I do not think that you can understand exactly the syntax of the logic that I'm, that I'm using, but I want to give you some intuition of, about the axioms of the ontology, the formulas that represent the knowledge of the domain. Okay, so the domain is represented by the following assertions. Every employee works for some project, and this is the first assertion in logic, right? Every employee has an, a, an employee code. In the domain, every employee has an employee code. Uh, every employee has a salary in the domain. So what I'm saying is that the domain that I'm talking about is such that every employee has a salary by definition, right? Um, a project, Every project has at least one employee working for it. Every project has a project name. That's another assertion. And every and if something works, works for something, then it's an employee. And if something has something that works for it, is a project. Okay, so that's the logical representation of a very simple domain about employees and project, okay? So my question is, I mean, if you want to have a pictorial representation of the knowledge that it's expressed in terms of the axioms, then you might, uh, you might want to look at this uh, diagram, right? And intuitively, I think that you can agree with me that this diagram really represents the axioms in the in the ontology here. Why? Because I have my my class employee, which is a predicate. I have my class project, which is another predicate. I have then uh, that every employee is an M -M -M code, a salary, and also every employee is a salary. And then there is this uh, idea that every employee works for a project and every project has at least an employee working for it. I think that there is a question from Paolo. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I understand this is introductory and uh, of course I understand that uh, I have perhaps a snapshot of uh, um, the theory uh, very, very uh, inaccurate at the moment. I just was wondering if, uh, like the first line, there is written employer, employee containing works for, and the, the one before the last one is uh, work for including employee. Does it mean that there is like a one-to-one -one correspondence? I don't know if this is completely out of uh, yeah. the target. Uh, okay, the two axioms together 
that's they say that employee, the predicate employee is equivalent to the projection of the relation works for. Okay. Right? So every employee works for something. And if you work for something, you must uh, be an employee. Okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Exactly. Like, you know, a teacher teaches something. And if you teach something, you are a teacher. So it's a kind of definition of the notion of employee, at least in this particular domain of this course. So as far as this ontology is concerned, an employee is defined as someone working for something. Okay? So I think you, 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 you capture, you, you got the idea, right? Thank you, thank you. Now, I want to notice, right? So guys, what is the difference between the ontology and the data sources? I think that we can somehow come back to the, to the, to the, to the question that uh, Destiny had. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know who is Destiny, but. I am stainless. <laughs> Destiny is a nice name, right? <laughs> So uh, Destiny had a, a, a question, right? Why, why, why am I using an ontology instead of somehow a new database schema? Well, I think that, the, you know, it's in some sense, uh, um, this example shows you the difference, right? Because the, on, the, on the right, you have a data structure, a set of data structures. And on the left, you have concepts and uh, logical assertions trying to define these concepts. And I want to notice a very important difference and of a very important uh, uh, observation. Um, on the left, you find the idea that every employee has a salary, right? This is a description of the domain so why? Because it is unconceivable to have an employee without a salary, right? So if I want to describe my domain, one reasonable assertion is that every employee has a salary. Now, look at the right. Does the data sources there imply that, that every employee has a salary? No, the answer is no. Why? They don't. Why? Because there might be many, many reasons why I know that there is an employee, but I don't know its salary. Why? For example, I might I might find a null value in the in the second column of the of the table D two, right? Showing that uh, I don't have the data about the salary of a certain employee. But not only that. I might have the knowledge that I have a, 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 an employee in table D1 because I know it's social security number, but I don't know anything about this employee in table D2, D, D2, right? So you see the difference. By definition of the domain, every employee has a salary, but I might have some incompleteness in my data, right? Therefore, if I ask something like, is it true that Paolo is an employee and has a salary? If you ask this question to the data, the answer is no, or at least the answer might be no, right? Because it might be that Paolo doesn't appear there with the salary. But if you ask the ontology, the answer is yes. Right? Well, at least if the query answering algorithm is able to exploit all the knowledge that I have expressed in my, in my logic. So what this very simple observation tells you, it tells you that answering queries in a, in a, in a context like the ontology-based data management is completely different from asking queries in a database because asking queries in a database just uh, 
reduces to look at the data, right? And trying to find the answer there. Answering queries over the ontology means trying to exploit all the knowledge that the, knowledge that the ontology has, and also, and also, not only, also look at the data in order to get the information. This means that we have to reason about the ontology and query answer really becomes completely different. I think that, uh, you know, only 17 slides I'll be able to show, uh, but uh, at least with this example, well, I didn't talk about the mapping, but I had an example before, so I don't think it's uh, really necessary to look at the mappings in this particular case. I think it's uh, 1250, um, yeah, 50. I think you had a very long morning, so I, I want to stop here. Uh, I, I only was, I was only able to give you the idea of what is the ontology based data management, why people have thought about this paradigm, which are, you know, the interesting, some interesting um, properties of this paradigm. But again, if you're curious about knowing more, uh, I will be available to you. And uh, I can also point to some interesting literature about this. So if there are no questions, I really thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a good day. Thank you very much, Professor. It was an honor having you with us today. Thank you very much. Is, is there any question before closing? Uh, many questions. I think we are fine. Uh, by my previous question, I think it's clear that by using an ontology, you have a more, uh, how to say, a more in depth and clear view on the data in comparison to the database. And it is very, it is much easier to use when the when the data are more complex right and 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 heterogeneous right yes because the nice thing here you you you, you can you can imagine right you can intuit uh, you can get the intuition that if you just ask tell me all the employees right mm -hmm. the algorithm will not will will do the dirty work to collect information both from table d1 and from table d2 right otherwise if you want to just query your database asking for all employees it's up to you to manage the heterogeneity between d1 and d2 right some some are social security numbers some are code it's up to you it's your work Instead, in an ontology-based data management uh, world, the algorithm should be able to answer the stupid query, give me all the employees. That's it. You see the yes. point? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a very attractive way, right, to, to access your data or to, to access your information, right? Your knowledge. Is it, is it correct to say that what you gain in using uh, uh, the, the ontology-based uh, language, you you basically gain uh, information about the domain of the data. So exactly. the domain, Absolutely. this is what you get more. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, instead of talking about data, you talk about the domain. Obviously, data are part of the domain, right? I mean, the, the instances. But the domain is much more complicated, complex, and sophisticated and you might want to be at that level, right at the level of the tables. Okay. Thanks. It was very interesting. Uh, there is still something that you said that it sounds a little bit like magic to me, but it's very introductory. <laughs> like when you said that, that more, more information comes automatically just considering this other domain, but of course I need to get deep in these uh, topics to understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah.
yeah, yeah. I, I understand your, your but, but it's it's really true. I mean, when when you have your knowledge expressed, you might you might apply some deduction rules that are unconceivable in a database, and therefore you might have more knowledge coming out from your data just because you use the ontology. Thank you. Very interesting. Bye bye, guys. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. I want to also thank all the attendees for being here and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.